basic fact is growth has surprised persistently you know, for the last year. The U.S. is quite boomy right now. That does not seem like an economy that has restrictive monetary policy. From just a growth perspective, we're exceeding expectations, but people are still nervous. The question is for the next 10, 15 years, is inflation at two and a half or three percent? And the economy is perfectly fine with that and can continue to grow. The U.S. is performing in an exceptional way. The question is, is that sustainable or temporary? This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Jonathan Perro, Lisa Abramowitz, and Anne-Marie Hordern. Live from the nation's capital for our audience worldwide. Good morning, good morning. This is Bloomberg Surveillance. The latest overnight, Israel said it would respond. Reportedly, it has responded. Long-range missiles targeting an Iranian Air Force facility. And the moves in crude, maybe not as obvious as you might think. We're lower. We're negative across the board. Let's bring up the board. WTI and Bren a little bit softer on the session. Most instructive, Bramo, what they didn't hit and Iran's response to it. Basically, this was signaling. They didn't hit any of the nuclear sites, and that was sort of the big fear that would cause some sort of retaliation by Iranian officials. But they did target specific areas by drone, the idea being this is messaging. We can do more if we want to. So, Anne-Marie, a couple of questions, I think. Have they demonstrated superior capability after the strikes from Iran on Israel? And do you think that's going to reinforce more of a deterrence for the Iranians going forward? Absolutely, in the sense that they took that fine line we've been talking about for weeks. How do you have an attack without sparking some retaliation cycle, this revenge cycle that they want to try to de-escalate? So it's an attack, but it's a de-escalation as well. And already there's reports that Iran says they're not going to uh, strike Israel after this. They were sending a clear message. And that's why you see Brent pulling back. Goldman Sachs this week said already there's 5 to $10 a barrel already in geopolitical risk premium into these markets, but futures may fall without escalation. This is not escalation. This is just capability showing that we can hit these targets if we wanted to. Okay, I'm just going to say for now, because you have to think, okay, this is a tit for tat. For now, Iran's not going to respond. For now, Israel isn't going to go after any of the more sensitive sites. But they're showing they've got the capability to do so. And right now, it seems like it, within Israel, there is a feeling, as one, uh, one of the representatives said, this is weak. So you do have that push on one side for a little bit more. Yeah, I think we end the week how we started the week, which was a couple of words that's been familiar to this program over the last few days. Contained. Contained but not calm. And not calm was how you phrased things on Monday. And I think that's still true this Friday. It is. What I found really interesting in markets was how markets actually responded. Because suddenly, where are the haven trades? Treasuries. How does this work? At what point does that break down, given the fact that ultimately, if you do get some kind of curtailing of oil flows, that is going to be fundamentally inflationary? So there are some real questions here about what calm means and what an escalation means beyond just this particular region. Big turnaround in equity futures. Equity futures overnight were down by more than one full percentage point at the moment. If we get to the board, equity futures at the moment, negative 0.4% on the S&P 500. Lisa talking about that bid into bonds, it sticks. Yields are lower by five basis points on a 10-year, 457.96. On the south side going into the weekend, no to the morning so far. I salute you, Michael Hartner, over at Bank of America. If the dove don't fit... <laughs> That's in the note this morning, in the flow show, the Bank of America regular weekly note. Yeah, well, and what he was talking about is that, and I'm going to use this because he used this, good economic news is starting to be bad news for stocks. I started reading this. I'm like, yes, we get to talk about good news. It's bad news, bad news, it's bad news. And I know that you love that so much, so I was excited for that. But this idea that we've had the biggest two weekly outflow from U.S. equity funds going back to December of 2022. There has been a shift where higher yields are punitive for equity valuations where they are. There's been a shift as one in the Fed speak. I think we have to acknowledge that. I don't think the base case has shifted just yet for many of the policymakers on the FOMC. But let's pick out two policymakers in the last 24 hours. Let's go with New York's John Williams and we can go with Kashgari of Minneapolis. Kashgari entertaining the idea that there might not be cuts until 2025. John Williams, not his base case, will be clear about that. Just enter entertaining the idea that if inflation demands it, they can push interest rates higher. Now, I'm not suggesting they're going to hike anytime soon, anything but, but I think they know what they're doing. When a Fed official comes out and uses that kind of language, they know exactly 
what they're doing? Are they pushing the tighter financial conditions? I will just take this a step further and say that this is a pivot from the pivot, because this is John Williams, who essentially was one of the bigger doves on the committee, coming out and raising the prospect of a hike at a time where they know how badly that's going to resonate on Wall Street. So it's a U-turn then? Is that what you're saying? The Fed is actually We've making a this. U-turn? The pivot on the pivot is the U-turn? It's not a U-turn. It's not a U-turn. Because okay. that's deliberate. Should we do that another time? We should do this in commercial breaks and maybe not live on the program. Coming up this hour, Victoria Fernandez across Mark as investors weigh outside risk in the middle of earnings season. Douglas Redeker of International Capital Strategies as Israel responds with a direct strike on Iran. And Tobias Adria of the IMF on the last mile of disinflation. We begin with our top story in this market. Investors weighing geopolitical risks and a more hawkish Fed as earnings season ramps up. Victoria Fernandez across Mark saying this. We will need to see earnings be the drive of further stock price appreciation. Over 70% of the S&P 500 companies have issued EPS guidance for Q1, have actually lowered estimates. Victoria joins us now for more. Victoria, great to catch up. We need to talk about the Middle East, the Fed speak. Let's start with the earnings. Are you saying that earnings won't be able to do the heavy lifting going into year end? I'm not sure they're going to be able to do as much heavy lifting as the market is anticipating. They're still looking at double-digit earnings growth. I think that's a big stretch. Obviously, we're just about a week and a half in to earnings right now. Banks were okay. Um, the market didn't have big moves on that. And obviously, we haven't hit a lot of those growth companies yet that tend to move the market a little bit more. But we're not seeing the lift that I think we're going to need to see in order for valuations to stay at a 21, 21 and a half, 22 times earnings that we're seeing. I think we're going to have to have a pullback somewhere in there, and earnings is probably going to be the catalyst for that to happen. Victoria, last time we spoke, you were looking for economic weakness. I've got to ask the question, where is it? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, you know, I expected that we would have seen more of that by now. There are some elements in there. And I guess weakness, John, we have to look and see how do we want to categorize that? Is weakness in the economy going to be the fact that the numbers are stronger and therefore the Fed is going to keep rates higher for longer and that puts more pressure on the economy? It's very much kind of a, um, a cycle when you get going there. But the consumer continues to be strong until we see the weakness in the labor market. Market, I don't think we're going to see that flow through to the rest of the economy. That's what we're waiting on. And it could be earnings. We're just talking about that. It could be margin pressure from earnings as pricing power starts to erode that is going to begin that cycle of pressure. Victoria, am I hearing from you? And I hate to do this. I'm so sorry. <laughs> but the good news is bad news. I knew it was coming. Bad news. And that right now we're looking at stocks that are poised for some sort of additional downturn, additional to what we've seen over the past five and maybe six sessions. Yeah, you know, what, a month ago, Lisa, I think everything was good news. It didn't matter what came out. It was all positive. It was all good news. Momentum was really driving the market. Um, and now I do think we're starting to see a little bit of shift in that, a lot because of what's come out from Fed speak, but also because I think people are concerned that we're not going to see the growth expectations that maybe um, were anticipated. So there's a lot of pressure on a handful of stocks. We know that. We'll see the earnings come through on those. Netflix obviously did better, but guidance was poor. So that stock is down. We'll see what happens um, with the rest of the handful of those stocks. But the momentum isn't what's driving us anymore. And I think that's key when we're looking. Low momentum names have actually outperformed high momentum over the last week. So I think we do have to take a step back. The equal weight S&P is below the peak that it had in early 2022. I think that's telling us that we're starting to see some worry come into this market. So, Victoria, what do you do with this, considering the fact that everyone just seems to be piling into oil stocks? So those have been getting a massive bid. Bonds are all over the place. I can't come up with a consistent narrative. <laughs> and then gold, a lot of people are saying maybe has gone a little too far. So what do you do? Well, I think you have to have some defensive components in your portfolio. We've talked about that before, and you know that we like the bond market as well, locking in some of the income that you can get in a barbell, both on the short end of the curve and the longer end of the curve to do that. But look, utilities are moving higher, even as rates are moving higher, which typically you don't see. You look at the telecom sector, again, another good defensive play that you can put in your portfolio. So there's some areas that you can go into to add some defensive posture. 
cancer, some low beta, some strong cash flow names. I think that's what you have to do right now as you wait to see how things play out over the next couple quarters. Well, Victoria, as we wait to see how things play out, we're waking up to a world where we did see retaliatory strikes from Israel on Iran, and the market is just shrugging this off. Do you expect this to continue to be basically the status quo until there is serious confrontation in the Gulf? Yeah, I think there's going to be a lot of turning going on here, Anne-Marie. I mean, obviously, the retaliation that we saw from Israel, many people are saying, yes, it was just a warning shot. Uh, it's just kind of letting them know we're here. And, you know, there's that phrase kind of mess around and, and find out what's going to happen. And I think that's what they were doing, which is why markets have um, rebounded from what we saw overnight. So I don't think that we'll see a huge shift today unless there's more action coming. But I can't imagine that this is going to be it. I can't imagine we're done. There's going to be more pressure coming from geopolitical events, along with the elements that we have going in in Congress. We've got four aid bills sitting there right now um, that need to be voted on. So I think there's a lot more coming, um, which is just going to cause more churning and more volatility in this market. Do you think that puts a flaw under crude? Because we have had a week of losses in a crude market. WTI and Brent pulling back, mid-80s on Brent, low-80s on WTI. What kind of a flaw do you think is in the energy market? Yeah, I don't know a number, Jonathan, on, on the, the floor for the market, but seeing the rally that we had overnight above 90 on Brent and the fact that it's pulled back to where it is now, I think you're looking at kind of a consolidation trade where we are here in the, the mid to low 80s. I would expect that we would stay somewhere in this range. And you're looking at OPEC Plus. I haven't seen any statement come out from them, but as of late, they're saying, look, we're going to continue with the cuts that are in place. They're not looking to add any more supply. Um, and as China starts to ramp up a little bit, you've got some more demand coming in. So I think we could move closer to that $90 range than to, say, a $75 or $80. So the big rotation, the elusive rotation that everyone was positioning for out of Q1 has faced a bit of a challenge, particularly for the small caps. Energy really started to work in the month of March coming into April. Victoria, is that a trade in the equity market that you want to stick with? I think you have to stick with it for now. And I'm not just saying that because I live in Houston, right? And I'm trying to pump up the, the energy trade. Um, but small caps have taken a really um, tough hit on the chin. And look, we think we're going to see some more correction. If you go down for the S&P 10%, that's down to the 200-day moving average. I wouldn't be surprised if we start to go closer to that level. And small caps are just going to continue to struggle. We need to see um, better economic strength globally. And I think we need to see the Fed have a, a fair plan laid out before we start to see a rebound in the market. That's when you're going to want to go into small caps. Energy continues to be a strong play with the good cash flow that they're seeing on their balance sheets. Hey, Victoria, great to catch up to close out the week with you. Victoria Fernandez there of Crossmark. Big repricing higher in interest rates over the last few months has really hammered the small caps. Another tough Another tough week, another struggle. Looking at crude, we're down about 0.5% on Brent, down about 03 on WTI. Let's give you an update on stories elsewhere. Here is your Bloomberg Brief with Danny Berger. Hey, Danny. Hey, John. Twelve jurors and one alternative have been selected for Donald Trump's trial in New York. It's his first trial and the first ever criminal trial against a former president. Opening arguments in the case could start as soon as Monday. Trump also faces three other criminal prosecutions. He's denied wrongdoing and claims the cases are part of a political witch hunt against him. Paramount shares surging in the pre-market, up more than 10% after a report that Sony and Apollo are considering a joint bid for the company. Paramount is in exclusive talks with Skydance, but the proposal has generated significant investor pushback. All that according to the New York Times. Apple has removed WhatsApp from its Chinese app store at Beijing's request. Threads, Telegram and Signal have also reportedly been removed. Apple said the country's cyberspace administration ordered that social media apps be removed over national security concerns. If that sounds familiar, it's because the U.S. has also cited national security concerns in politicians' push to force a sale or a ban of TikTok. And that's your Bloomberg Brief. John. Hey, Danny, thank you. Appreciate it. You spot the difference, though. The difference in how things get done in China versus the United States. We're still working this out in Congress. In there's, China, it's just like, bang, Apple, done. There's a healthy debate in China, what they call the Great Firewall. We want to get rid of some of this stuff. We want to control some of the communication. And it's done overnight. Just like that. Coming up on the program, up next, Israel retaliates. Israeli retaliation 
will likely be proportional. It will likely be limited. It will likely be uh, something that is meant to demonstrate uh, we can touch you in ways that hurt. And it looks like that's exactly what it was overnight. That conversation up next, live from Washington. Good morning. Equity markets recovering from overnight losses on the S&P 500, negative by something like 0.4%, down a lot more than that late yesterday evening. We were down by more than one full percentage point. Yields, though, still lower. Heading south, we're down by six basis points, 456.73, and crude settling down, softer by six tenths of 1% on WTI 82.26. Under surveillance this morning, Israel retaliates. Israeli retaliation will likely be proportional. It will likely be limited. It will likely be uh, something that is meant to demonstrate uh, we can touch you in ways that hurt. Um, and for that reason, I think Israel is also not looking for a conventional war uh, itself. It's the latest this morning. Israel launching a retaliatory strike against Iran, according to U.S. officials. Iranian media reporting an explosion in the country's third largest city. The IAEA saying no damage was done to nuclear sites. The news adding to pressure in Congress as the House looks to pass a $96 billion aid package for Israel, Ukraine and Taiwan this weekend. Douglas Redeker, founder of International Capital Strategies, joins us around the table this morning. Doug, good morning to you. Morning. It's good to see you. Do you believe that Iran, based on reports, has just witness superior capability coming out of Israel? Well, it depends on who's uh, going to answer that question. I think objectively, from what we know, this seems to be, as your uh, guest you know, that you just showed the tape said, it's a limited response that shows a signal that we can do more. But of course, the Iranians are spinning it as, no, no, we, we shot these things down. And, and as I understand it, they're not even mentioning it. The president gave a speech today, didn't even mention the attack, went back to the attack last week, didn't mention this attack. The Israelis, of course, are saying, yeah, well, we showed them. Um, let's see. I think one of the things that we have to think about is what does the White House think? Because, of course, the White House said don't do anything. So is the White House going to say, all right, well, you did something just not as much as you could have. So you kind of deferred to us. Or does the White House say, hey, we told you don't do anything. Now you did this. Now there's a risk. The RRGC are a bunch of bad guys. So whether they have decided to retaliate or say they're going to retaliate this morning or not, there's still a risk that there's going to be an escalation here. And that's what the White House obviously does not want to see. You brought up the White House. So let's talk about that a little bit more. Let's explore it together. So the White House told Iran, don't. Iran did. They told the Israelis, take the win. They didn't. So how much influence does the White House actually have over what's happening in the Middle East? Uh, more than I think your question suggests, but a lot less than we'd like it to be. So if you go to where the Israeli war cabinet wanted to be, they're, you know, all in, right? Even the, there is no dovish wing of the Israeli public or the Israeli government anymore. There's hawkish and even more hawkish. So on that basis, I think that the Israelis have been, believe it or not, somewhat restrained in how they've responded not only overall to the Iran re response, but to Rafa, to Gaza. I mean, it's hard to say it's anything other than egregious in many cases, but it has been somewhat more restrained than we thought might have been the case. Having said all of that, obviously the White House has been trying to tell Netanyahu and his government don't do a lot of the things that they're doing anyway. So it's a, it's a balanced picture here. But I don't think it's right to say the White House has no influence. I think in particular in the Rafa thing. Remember, six weeks ago, the threat was, if there's no hostage release by Ramadan, we're going into Rafah. Now we're after Ramadan, and they still haven't gone into Rafah. That doesn't mean they won't, but it does mean that there's been some tempering of the worst-case scenarios. Doug, you've done a lot of work on sanctions, not just when it comes to sanctions the United States puts on countries like Iran, but also Russia. Have any of these sanctions worked? Because <laughs> the U.S. is mulling new ones, but they have a laundry list of others. It just doesn't seem like they're enforcing them. Yeah, so uh, your, your question has a lot of parts to it. First of all, let me start with the, the end of your question. Enforcement is the key, right? So what we do, what we say, and then whether we enforce it are often two different things. First of all, sanctions used to be very rare. Then over the past decade, they've become enormously commonplace. That's a problem for the markets, because what are sanctions? Sanctions are basically the government stepping in and impairing commercial relationships for geopolitical or other strategic reasons, right? That's what they are. 
They are simply saying, you have a contract. We're going to tell you you can't enforce the contract. You want to buy something, you want to sell something. We're going to say no. Okay. But then the question is on oil, which is where a lot of the sanctions are focused, Venezuela, Iran, Russia. What we've seen is sanctions that are not only porous, they're almost blatantly ignored. And so the question then becomes, if you put on sanctions and if you ignore the compliance with those sanctions, then are you undermining the effectiveness of those sanctions? The one part of the sanctions regime that works, and it really works, is secondary sanctions. That's where we basically say no bank in the world can touch anything that has even a secondary relationship with something that we've sanctioned. So the banks, which have enormous compliance departments, say, okay, we're not going to touch this. We have not done that in most cases. Why? Because we're worried we're going to wrap up Chinese banks and other banks in a much more broad-based, geopolitically significant way. So we're saying, number one, we kind of like oil being on the market because it helps gasoline prices. Number two, we don't want to go there on the secondary sanctions level. So, yes, we're escalating sanctions. Yes, they're a serious threat. No, we don't enforce them very well at all. Well, all these issues are basically a cloud that's overhanging the IMF meetings, especially what oil, higher oil prices would mean to some of these central banks at the same time that they're dealing with a stronger dollar. How much are you seeing on the sidelines of the, the, this IMF? How much U.S. policy is impacting the rest of the world? Uh, it's certainly a major topic of the official meetings. So it's hard to say that people aren't saying, wow, U.S. Fed policy, U.S. fiscal policy, the debt deficits. And, you know, that has been a percolating uh, message across the meetings. What's interesting to me is if you go back six months ago to Marrakesh, to the last time this group got together, Many of the same issues were, were there, but the reaction to participants then was one of enormous, I don't want to call it panic, but it was enormous unsettling nervousness. Now the same issues are here, and everybody seems to be saying, it's too uncertain for us to figure out how to price it, so we're going to ignore it. And that's really interesting to me. It's almost the difference between risk and uncertainty. Uncertainty is too big to price, so you can either take your money off the board and go home, or you can say, I'm just going to ignore it. And that's what seems to be what's going on. That's where I wanted to go. How much is this faith in the election cycle, given the fact that ultimately some of the people of this administration in particular doesn't want disruptions of a certain type, read higher oil prices ahead of the election. And so therefore, they probably are going to pull out all the stops to either not enforce sanctions or unleash the Strategic Petroleum Reserve to prevent that from happening. So why not bet on that? Why not bet on the Federal Reserve well, doing the same kind of thing? So the, the, the premise of the question is the uncertainty, right? This is not the stuff that you can model out. You know, one of the problems that markets have is they don't do geopolitical risk very well. But they also don't understand politics very well. They think they do. They get obsessed by it. But they're really pretty bad at it. So, I, I mean, to answer a different question than the one you're answering, you're asking, is you know, everybody is saying to me, what's going to happen in the election? And everybody's telling me what their favorite pundit is saying. And I keep saying, you've got to be kidding me. It's April. Right? There are going to be 25 surprises between now and November. There are going to be 10 surprises in October alone. There are going to be five of those are going to be man-made. Five of those are going to be natural disasters. Who the hell knows? So everybody is kind of looking at the U.S. election as the huge elephant in the room. And I've met with a number of government delegations this week. And I've said, how much is that impacting your thinking? And a lot of them say, it's not, because we just don't know what to do about it. We found ourselves misplaced back in January, coming out of Davos. Everybody was like, Trump's going to win. Trump's going to win. Now everybody's like, we don't know. I said, so what are you going to do about it? They say, we don't know. <laughs> Doug, it's great to catch up with you, sir. Appreciate it. It's fantastic to see you. Always a pleasure. Thanks. Douglas Redeker there of the International Capital Strategies, weighing in on a whole host of issues. The lack of international cooperation seems to be a big, big issue down here in Washington, D.C. this week. The IMF spring meetings with the World Bank. Bramo, you're going to catch up with Geeta Gopinath a little bit later. What's the big topic? Well, she wrote this paper, and I was actually reading through the whole thing last night, where she was talking about what uh, fragmentation actually looks like. And what she found is it's not less trade. It's just going through intermediaries that actually create less efficiency. So I want to understand how much that's going to be inflationary going forward on a structural basis, in addition to some of the other issues that we've been talking about. Looking forward to that conversation a little bit later on this morning. Coming up next on this program, Tobias Adrian of the IMF. That's coming up very shortly, live from Washington, D.C., with equity futures recovering on the S&P 500, this is Bloomberg.
five-day losing streak on the S&P 500 coming into Friday. Could become day six. Equity futures negative here on the S&P by 0.4%. On the Nasdaq, down by 0.7%. We're off by three-quarters of 1% on the Russell. The small cap's not having a good time through the month of April. On the S&P, the longest daily losing streak going back to late October. Let's switch up the board and get to the bond market. Big moves again this week. Two-year yields making their way back towards 5% in yesterday's session, then pulling back four basis points. The two-year, 494.71. You just get the feeling that the conversation, maybe not the conclusion, but the conversation is changing at the Federal Reserve based on some of the commentary, Lisa, we've had over the last few days. And the John Williams note that you pointed out, really, to me, that speech highlighted just how much of a turnaround there's actually been. This was one of the big doves coming out and even acknowledging the possibility of a hike if the data were to come in harder than expected really speaks to a complete shift in how they're thinking about this. Four consecutive weeks, the two-year yields have been pushing higher. So yields have been pushing higher again this week, trimming some of that gain just on today's session. If you switch to the board, and you probably want to know where crude is. Crude's a bit softer on the session and down on the week as well. For a second week, we're down by 0.6%, 86.56, WTI down to 82.29. The market is sort of embracing this idea that things are contained in the Middle East. But Lisa, I think you've done a fantastic job this week of making sure that this market alone doesn't shape your thoughts exclusively as to what is happening in the Middle East. Because as Norman Rule said on Monday, this is a new Middle East after the lines we crossed over the weekend and again overnight. And you saw that with respect to the knee-jerk reaction going up to $90 on print very quickly in terms of what kind of reaction it is. And frankly, in every note that we get across Wall Street, people talking about the increasing possibility of a $100 barrel oil of oil if there is some sort of greater escalation that could be highly punitive for other potential asset classes. Greater escalation that hits global supply. So what we've seen in terms of, terms of missiles back and forth between Israel and Iran does not touch a barrel of oil. And that's why you're seeing all this risk taken out. Now, if it was to touch, say, vessels in the Strait of Hormuz, then we have a different price on Brent. 86.56 is the price on Brent right now. Under surveillance this morning, Israel launching a strike on Iran after vowing to respond to last week's unprecedented attack on the country. Explosions were heard in Iran's third largest city. The United Nations watchdog says nuclear facilities located there are safe. The details, I have to say, at 6.32 Eastern time here in America, still really vague and very foggy. At first it was missiles, then it was drones. We've got various reports coming out of Iran suggesting that this was unsuccessful and they won't be doing anything about it. What do we actually know, Anne-Marie, about what took place late last night? Well, there's still a lot we're trying to digest. It also depends what media you listen to. So Israeli media is saying it was missiles. Iranian media is saying it is drones. And actually, it wasn't big enough to even warn a national security meeting that they're having. They are trying to downplay this, potentially for two reasons. One, they want to show that they got the last big hit. And two, if they really don't want to escalate, they have to show that their, their public domestic consumption, that this wasn't big enough to then warrant an escalation back to Israel. To your point, John, we don't know what they hit. That was one of the big questions. What exactly were they targeting? It was a highly targeted strike on what? So, yeah, still a lot of questions out there. Demonstrating capability, I think, is a conclusion that a lot of people made on Monday before we even had these strikes. And if you are targeting that specific city, isn't that what you're trying to demonstrate, that you can if you need to. Absolutely. Isfayan is where you will have nuclear facilities. It's where you will have drone manufacturing. It's where also one of the big cities that was key for Iran when they targeted Israel with those more than 300 missile and drones. So what Israel is saying at this moment is, we are not hitting you right now, but do it again and we will hit you. That's the latest on strikes in Iran. We'll give you regular updates throughout this morning, of course, on Bloomberg surveillance. Tech season, tech earnings season kicking off. We should check in on Netflix. Shares actually falling in pre-market trading. The streaming service giant posting its best start to the year since 2020. However, the company's guidance saying they expect subscriber gains to be lower this period and investors will no longer get quarterly membership metrics. That's what's weighing on this stock, Brammer. We're down by about 6.8%. It's hard to point to subs growth as a reason for the stock to be up when the company itself is saying it's no longer going to provide it going forward. Because they're going to get value in other ways. 
which means basically prices are going up. If you read this release, it's basically like, how many ways can they raise prices on your Netflix account? And oh yeah, if you are <clears throat> sharing anyone's account, then you potentially are going to have a People problem do that? <clears throat> going forward. But I am thinking that maybe this also speaks to just how much risk aversion there is in the market right now, that not even that big of a miss gets punished this much in markets. I can't decide whether this is how the audience who are around this table is a password sharer or not. You is can't it tell? a sharer? Is it a moocher? I just it's a moocher. Say this. A moocher? It, it I'm is going a moocher. to say this. I think Netflix has done a fantastic job cracking down on passwords, but maybe they need to do a little bit better. <laughs> <laughs> Netflix is down by 6.66%. Let's get you the Fed wrap. Presidents Kashkari and Williams saying rate cuts may not come this year. Williams adding that a hike is still possible, if warranted by the data. Bostick saying a cut is unlikely until the end of the year and that he has to be open to higher rates. Tobias Adrian of the IMF also warning the fight against inflation may be stalling, saying this, there is recent evidence that disinflation may have stalled in some countries. Higher than expected readings could challenge the last mile narrative and related investor optimism. I'm pleased to say that Tobias is with us now. Joining us from Washington, D.C. for more. Tobias, fantastic to catch up with you, sir. The last mile has proven to be difficult. Rates have repriced higher. It's driven a much stronger U.S. dollar. And we're seeing complaints from all over the world, from Japan to South Korea, Malaysia and elsewhere. Tobias, at these meetings this week, have those countries been given a green light to intervene if they need to? Yeah, good morning. Uh, very good uh, to spend uh, time with you uh, today. Uh, so we have certainly seen uh, quite a bit of movement uh, in the dollar uh, since uh, the beginning of the year, in, in particular since uh, the announcements uh, of uh, inflation data in the U.S. that was uh, above expectations. Uh, the moves we are seeing in currencies is fairly closely aligned with moves in currency differentials. Uh, so we're watching uh, the situation closely. Do you think if this is driven by larger deficits and industrial policy that perhaps countries are maybe have a stronger argument to intervene than maybe they otherwise would do? Well, um, when we are thinking uh, about currencies, we look at uh, two uh, main inputs. The one are fundamentals. So exchange rate uh, differentials are uh, a key driver of exchange rates. The second thing we're looking at are market conditions. So to what extent are market conditions orderly or disorderly? Uh, to date, uh, these movements have been uh, fairly orderly, but uh, we will certainly uh, be monitoring uh, the situation. Do I, as some people have been talking about the idea of the election and what could happen if there are proposals for tariffs, uh, as well as potentially increasing the deficit further, whether we could see something akin to what we saw in the United Kingdom under the former Liz Truss. Do you think that that's a risk? Well, we have certainly seen uh, fluctuations in longer term bond yields uh, in the U.S. and around the world. Um, some of that uh, is certainly driven about expectations of uh, fiscal policy uh, going forward. Uh, but there are also uh, other ingredients uh, such as um, uh, Federal Reserve uh, policy and other central bank policy about uh, quantitative uh, tightening, i.e. the balance sheet uh, going forward. Um, and then uh, the economic outlook. Um, so part of uh, the, the drive up in uh, bond yields is reflective of the very strong economic performance, particularly in the U.S., that really has kept surprising to the upside in recent months. One thing that we're trying to get a handle on, Tobias, and you're wonderful with this, is understanding where financial systemic risk is. And I guess that that's the reason why we're focused on the dollar. When is it going to be strong enough to break something? That's what we're focusing on yields. When are they high enough to break something? Where do you think the biggest financial systemic risk lies? Well, the good thing is that the major emerging markets have been very resilient. Uh, really, over the past five years, we have seen massive shocks, uh, the pandemic, uh, inflation, geopolitical contentions, and uh, the strong policy frameworks, uh, the higher reserve levels, uh, the strong regulation of banks has kept these major emerging markets very resilient, uh, really, for a long time. Um, so when we are looking at financial stability issues, we continue to worry 
about uh, financial uh, sector weaknesses in some corners. Uh, in most countries, there's a weak tail in the banking sector and in the baseline of a soft landing and of uh, global inflation coming down, that weak tail is probably okay. But in an adverse scenario where inflation is higher than expected, more persistent, where interest rates are moving and where credit risk may deteriorate more than what is currently priced in, we could certainly see some uh, uh, turbulence uh, going forward. Tobias, what is that weak tail? Are you talking about hedge funds that have dominant positions in treasuries? Are you talking about regional banks? What is it? Um, so uh, banks uh, around the world do have uh, exposure uh, to credit risk. Um, for example, in the U.S., there are some institutions that have uh, exposure to commercial real estate. Uh, and of course, quite a bit of commercial real estate is coming uh, to uh, refinancings this year and next year. Uh, so a combination of um, uh, the macro outlook uh, uh, together with uh, a tightening of financial conditions could put some banks, but also some non-banks, uh, under pressure. The IMF really pointed to loose fiscal policy in the United States as being an issue for the rest of the world. How much do you see the Inflation Reduction Act out of the U.S., that fiscal policy adding to inflation that the rest of the world is dealing with? Well, the good thing uh, for the world is that the U.S. economy has been very strong, um, and that is, of course, a positive spillover to other countries. Demand is strong. Capital market activity is very strong. Capital markets have reopened uh, for very countries that weren't able to issue in the past year or year and a half, and we have seen very strong issuance. Uh, so uh, the uh, dollar markets really uh, remain uh, very important for issuers uh, around the world. Um, you know, financial conditions have been tightening to some degree uh, in uh, recent days uh, as uh, volatility and uncertainty more broadly uh, has increased. Uh, but, uh, you know, spreads remain uh, fairly tight even for riskier issues. Um, so overall, uh, the picture remains fairly positive. Interesting. Tobias, we appreciate that assessment this morning. Thank you, sir. I know you've got a very busy day ahead of you. Tobias Adrian there of the International Monetary Fund. And what's happening in capital markets right now worldwide? We've heard plenty of complaints from places like Japan, South Korea and Malaysia. Malaysia has had to intervene in the FX market because of this rip-roaring dollar. Plenty of concerns about potential crowding out in capital markets given where yields are in America and the amount of capital that that's currently attracting into U.S. capital markets. But what you heard there, Bramo, was almost the positive assessment of the spillovers that come from better than expected U.S. growth. Basically, this is the reason why the IMF upgraded their forecast for growth globally, so that this is more of a positive than a negative. OK, maybe you're not going to hear that from some of these central bankers that have to deal with it on the other side. But this, to me, raises this question. Are we looking at a world where it's going to be stronger dollar and there isn't necessarily the disruption to derail that? Also, remember all that discussion about de-dollarization? Yeah. Uh, where do we go with that narrative? His assessment of the FX market was interesting. So the way they look at things, have we seen excess volatility or disorderly moves? I think the way the rest of the world looks at things is, OK, is this based on fundamentals? Is this based on unsustainable policies? Is this based on policies that we just can't compete with? So if you believe this is based in part on an unsustainable fiscal deficit, in part on perhaps even industrial policy, and you're a country that maybe doesn't have the ability to do the same thing, certainly does not have the privilege that America has when it comes to raising debt and going forward with big industrial policy initiatives like the Indu Inflation Reduction Act that you mentioned. OK, then do you have a reason to intervene? Which is kind of what I was trying to get at there. How legitimate would intervention be in countries that do not have the options in front of them that America does? I would argue you could draw an analogy between what you just described and in a way, what China is doing with respect to putting their thumb on industrial policy and subsidizing it. On one level, you can say, OK, that's not a fair playing field. The U.S. has the privilege to borrow and then to fuel uh, a recovery that allowed it to avoid the scarring of the pandemic that the rest of the world did. So then do you have a legitimate reason to intervene? But can you? And I think that that might be the more relevant That's question. a much tougher question. Yeah. I think you're fighting against what? What did you say? It's like throwing money uphill and hoping it doesn't roll back down. 
That's a great phrase earlier this you. week. Thanks. I think it's true. I appreciate it. And it's exactly what they're trying to confront in foreign exchange at the moment. Let's get an update on stories elsewhere this morning. Let's get to the Bloomberg Brief. We can do that with Danny Berger. Hey, Danny. Hey, John. High prices are still hitting UK shoppers. Retail sales in the country unexpectedly stalled in March. So- shoppers scaled back spending on food and department stores. The volume of growth was unchanged in March. Economists had expected 8.3% increase. Deutsche Bank is overhauling its staff for some Asia offices, trimming 10 private banking roles over the last week. As many as 60 were cut in Singapore and Hong Kong over the last year. Deutsche Bank wants to focus on more profitable markets and weed out underperformers, according to people familiar with the matter. Tesla shares lower pre-market this morning, down nearly 2%. They recalled almost 4,000 cyber trucks. Tesla will be repairing accelerator pedals that can dislodge come trapped and cause the cars to unintentionally accelerate. Tesla says the fix will be free of charge. That's your Bloomberg Brief. John. Yeah, that's the problem. Danny, thanks for that. Up next on the program, tech earnings season kicking off. Up next, a new approach from Netflix. We're not going to be silent on members as well. We'll periodically update uh, when we grow and we hit certain major milestones. We'll announce those. It's just not going to be part of our regular reporting. That conversation up next, live from Washington, this is Bloomberg. Equity futures right now in New York, negative by 0.4% on the S&P 500. Just a little bit softer, but I can tell you last night, much weaker. Negative by more than one full percentage point as we start to get reports of retaliation from Israel on Iran. And I have to say the details of those reports, still pretty vague. We'll try and get you more detail as the show grows older. Yields are lower by seven basis points on a 10-year 456 53 and in the commodity market negative by 0.6% on WTI 82.27. This week we wrapped up earnings on Wall Street and now the attention starts to turn to big tech on the West Coast. Under surveillance this morning, Netflix's new approach. We're going to report and guide on revenue, on OI, OI margin, uh, net income, EPS, free cash flow. We're not going to be silent on members as well. We'll periodically update uh, when we grow and we hit certain major milestones. We'll announce those. It's just not going to be part of our regular reporting. We're going to continue to report subscribers until Q1 of next year. Here's the latest this morning. Netflix falling in the pre-market despite posting its best start in four years, adding over 9 million new customers, nearly doubling estimates. The company also announcing it will stop reporting paid quarterly memberships and revenue per subscriber in 2025. Joining us now is Bloomberg's Geetha Raghunathan for more. Now, Geetha, this stock in the pre-market has been getting slammed over the last few hours. And it's interesting because the numbers themselves, pretty decent. So I think we have to start elsewhere. Removing certain disclosures. Geetha, do you sense that's what's spooking this stock this morning? Yeah, absolutely, John. Uh, it, it, it has definitely rankled investors because, remember, Netflix at its very core is a subscriber story. It always has been a subscriber story. I mean, this has been one of the easiest companies in the media space to model out. You have number of subscribers, you have their average revenue uh, contribution per month, you just multiply those and, and you have your whole Netflix model. But that's not the way it is going to be anymore. There's just so much more nuance uh, to the way that the model is working because the company now is, is a mature company and that's really what they're, uh, what they're saying. Uh, but obviously it is going to be very hard for investors to map out the growth because you don't have that subscriber disclosure and that's really adding to uncertainty. But Geetha, can we just throw this in as well? The company itself has been terrible at guiding around subs for a long, long time. If you just look, even though we've been getting used to this company over the last 10 years, if you look at the way subs come in relative to the estimate, it's all over the place every single quarter. Geetha, is there something actually to take away from this that maybe this is the right thing? Just move on. No one can predict this stuff. Yeah, I, I, I do think so. I think, you know, we've, with Netflix, what you see is this tremendous volatility around earnings. To your point, John, it is hard for them to predict things. And, and you know, this is, I think, in a way, the, the right approach for them to take. I, you know, they have consistently said over the past couple of quarters that, you know, subscriber growth is no longer the main metric. Yes, it is important, but what they really want investors to focus on is are the financials, right? Double-digit revenue growth, operating income, 
and look at the operating margins. We're, we're getting to 25% this year, possibly 30% in the next couple of years. And that's really been the question all along, right, John? Can Netflix replicate the old media model where companies were earning about 30, 32% margins? And it looks like, yes, they can, and maybe they can even exceed that. So just not on a selfish level, but maybe a little bit on a selfish level, Geetha, I was reading some of the commentary by the executives. And they were talking about monetizing certain corners as they provide more quality and value to their subscribers, which just is huge dollar signs in my mind of how much more I'm going to be paying for Netflix. Do we have a sense of what kind of price increases we can expect going down the line? Oh, there is absolutely, Lisa, there are absolutely going to be price increases. There is no question about that. And I think the fact that they introduced this uh, new advertising-based tier, it's a lower price tier, about $7 a month here in the U.S., that kind of gives them a, a lot of leeway, a lot of flexibility to raise prices without really having to worry about subscriber churn. So you look at the standard price uh, of, or, or the price of a standard plan uh, of Netflix, it's about $15.50. Uh, it, that The price on that plan hasn't really gone up now for more than two years. So, you know, rest assured, they're absolutely going to raise prices on that. Uh, and, you know, they were asked this question on the call, you know, uh, how much more runway do you think you have? Where is the ceiling? And they actually cited the pay TV bundle as the ceiling, which I thought was really interesting because, you know, the average price of a pay TV bundle is $70. Now, I don't think they're necessarily going to take it that far, but obviously they have a lot of pricing levers and they're going to ex exercise them definitely. Is this the new model, Geetha? Because this is kind of what we heard from Disney, too, that they're going to charge more for some of their premium content and they're not necessarily going to focus on growth. Is this the new streaming model at a time where we're reaching, I don't want to say saturation points, but maybe saturation points? Yeah, I think we are definitely reaching saturation point. I think that's what part of, you know, the not disclosing subscribers also kind of tends to indicate that. Uh, but yes, it's all, it's going to be all about pricing because remember the new mantra in the streaming model, in the, in the, uh, a media model is profitability, is operating income, is free cash flow, and Netflix is delivering. And the one way that they can do that is to keep raising prices uh, at a regular cadence. Uh, Gita, can you tell us what the latest is in terms of Paramount? Do you see this Apollo deal with Sony potentially going through? Um, I, I'm not yet sure about the details, but I think it's definitely great news for investors. They were always very dubious about, uh, you know, the Skydance Paramount negotiations that was not well received. You know, most of the non-voting shareholders felt that they would be diluted at the expense of, you know, uh, the, the Redstones kind of uh, getting a better deal uh, in that in that transaction. So the fact that, you know, Apollo already actually came in with an offer for Paramount, a 26 billion offer, but there were always concerns, I think, both on the management side as well as maybe even some investors uh, about whether they would be able to finance that. But now that you have Sony, which is a huge player, huge experience, a huge media conglomerate coming in, uh, I think it's really good news for investors. Paramount right now up by more than 10% of the pre-market. Geetha, wonderful summary as always. Geetha Raghunathan there of Bloomberg Intelligence. Let's get Netflix back up. Not a great start to tech earnings. If you do consider that stock a tech name, we're down by more than 6% in the pre-market as they start to pull back on certain disclosures with negative 6.44%. I think the only thing you care about are the numbers we get in early May, and that's Apple. Apple just around the corner. And Lisa, for me, Apple, the standout this earnings season. Let's not try and be cute about it. Given the year they've had so far, given the amount of different stories, touch points, tension that they touch, I think that's got to be the story of earnings season. And it's rather inauspicious that the Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing Company came out with a warning about smartphone sales when they talked about chip demand there going down. How high is the bar right now? And I think that's also the question that we have to ask around Netflix. They, perf they performed really well when it came to adding subscribers this quarter. Just simply the elimination of that really sent the shares down. So how high is the bar for the likes of Apple and the well, rest? What Gita said is that if you do not have those disclosures, it's going to be even harder to try to map out what the growth model looks like and the profit margins look like for a company like Netflix. Apple, though, I'm so interested in two things, China how bad is it, given some of the preliminary data we're seeing, they are really struggling in that market? And AI, they want to do an AI MacBook. What does that actually look like? Is it just basically 
trying to sell Mac, MacBooks, more of them, by attaching AI to it? Or is this really going to be a brand new product that you have to go out and get? Can earnings support this equity market? Equities right now negative by 0.5%. Need to talk about the latest in the Middle East. We'll do that next. We'll catch up with Nadia Lovell of UBS, Terry Haynes of Pangea Policy, the brilliant Adam Poston of the Peterson Institute, and retired Brigadier General Mark Kimmett. That conversation just around the corner. Futures lower, Treasuries a bid, and crude. Everything's pretty contained at the moment. 82.35 on WTI. Live from Washington, this is Bloomberg. We think that um, ultimately they will, they are not um, going to be cutting in the middle of the year. We've concluded that there are going to be no rate cuts this year uh, whatsoever. At some point, they might realize they need higher rates to kind of, you know, tame the economic conditions. I do think that it is a realization of investors that we are in a higher interest rate for longer. But to make the assumption, we know what Jerome Powell and the Fed is going to do three months from now, I don't think makes a lot of sense. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Jonathan Perro, Lisa Abramowitz, and Anne-Marie Hordern. Live from Washington, D.C. this morning. Good morning. Good morning for our audience worldwide. This is Bloomberg Surveillance. Perhaps some of you up late last night looking for more detail on the strikes reportedly conducted by Israel on Iran. We've still got tons of questions and very few answers. The nature of those strikes, what was behind them? Was it drones? Was it missiles? What did they hit and how much damage was done? It depends which press you're looking at. The Israeli press says these were missiles. The Iranian press says these were drones. The fact of the matter is there's still a lot of details we do not know. But it's obvious that at the moment, this was really a messaging tool. It hit a city that has facilities, nuclear facilities. It hit a facility where Iran has launched some of their strikes from. And it's a message of we can hurt you, even if we aren't right now. They want to establish some level of deterrence. Let's bring up the crude board and take a look at WTI and Brent. We are trading a little bit lower throughout this morning, pulling back on crude, both Brent and the WTI contract. Brent crude down at 86.47, negative by three quarters of 1%. Similar move on WTI, actually heading towards another weekly loss, Bramo. But I keep going back to something you said at the start of the week, Lisa. Contained, steady, sure, but not calm, anything but. And that's the reason why overnight we saw such a big jump. Doug Redeker, actually, I think, summed it up perfectly, where he said, you know, back at Marrakesh, where IMF had its last confab, they were talking about the concern around uncertainty and people were feeling sort of negative around it. This time, it's like what Lori Calvacina said, staring into the sun. We can't price it. We don't know what to do with it. So we're going to ignore it. And that goes with pretty much everything. And in the crude market, I think that a real good question is how much risk premium is actually priced in, given the fact that so many people are talking about $100 a barrel, should there be a true protracted escalation? Well, Goldman Sachs already says it's about 5 to 10 maybe $15 max already priced in. So if you don't have that escalation, which we don't today, given what this strike basically is symbolizing, that this is a message and a signal, you're going to see the market start to pull back. And of course, we're waking up with not a single barrel of oil actually hit. Now, if there's something that happens in the Strait of Hormuz, potentially we wake up to a different story. Elisa, you mentioned what Doug Reddick has said. Let's lead on that just a little bit more. The degree of influence that this White House has over events building in the Middle East right now, and let's take two different stories. So they basically turn around and tell Iran, don't. And Iran did last weekend. They tell the Israelis to take the win. The Israelis, based on reports overnight, did not. How much influence does this White House still have over what takes place in the Middle East? What Doug Redeker was saying is more than it seems because of what's going on with Rafah and other areas where you haven't seen uh, a red line crossed that Joe Biden had put out there. I do think that there is a question, though, of where the limits of that are. I also wonder how much oil prices are influencing the White House's decision making, considering the fact that prices cannot go up materially if they want to win the election. That at least is the feeling among a lot of political strategists. The U.S. posture in the Gulf and the U.S. rhetoric that we have heard is constant defense, similar, trying to take the temperature out of the room. It's similar what we're seeing overseas and similar what we're seeing actually when they're at the bully pulpit speaking about these issues. We've talked a lot with Norman Rule about this exact moment. Is the U.S. moving from a posture of deterrence in the region or defense? And whether it's not their actions or their words... It's a defense. I'll tell you what I don't see, and I think we probably all share this opinion. I don't see any appetite whatsoever from this White House, led by this president, to do anything to disrupt global oil supply in any way, shape or form. Zero. Because if they wanted to, they would have gone after, not, has not come up with this 
price cap on Russia. They would have actually gone after Russian oil and gas, which is the money that is fueling Putin's ability to continue to fund this war in Ukraine. And if they wanted to go after Iranian barrels, they can. They did put pressure on China and the teapots in China that more than 80 percent of Iranian oil goes to. But they're not. The sanctions, I said it yesterday, the sanctions are there on paper. They're not enforced. We're expecting to hear from Secretary Blinken a little bit later this hour, so look out for comments from him. Any headlines that are worthy of talking about, we'll bring them to you. Equity futures right now on the S&P 500. Let's check in on the market. A little bit softer, negative by 0.4%. Yields a little bit lower on the session over the last few weeks, though, a whole lot higher. We're down five basis points this Friday, 457.76. Let's talk about the Fed speak, Bramo. OK, the conclusion hasn't changed. They're still looking to cut later this year, but let me tell you, this conversation has changed in a massive way in the last few weeks. And let me tell you that John Williams was the one who really seemed to exemplify that the most to me, considering the fact that he is so dovish and even entertained the idea of hiking rates again, should the information really uh, be there. Neil Kashkari, meanwhile, talking about how there is a real possibility they are not going to uh, cut rates this year. It's going to be 2025 when they cut rates for the first time. It's a new tone. Albeit, maybe not definitive. I love the Bramo tone. tone. Let me tell you, it's my you favorite Bramo phrase. Let no, me tell I it's, you. Your, it's my favorite phrase of yours. It's a lot of fun. Let me tell you something. Yeah, yeah. Let, Let me, me tell, tell you, you missed Jonathan Pingle of UBS. Maybe I did miss that. Maybe Williams was listening to him. This probability. What, what did he say? Not the base case, but the probability that they are starting to look at that there could be a hike. And that's a pivot of a pivot, which is a U-turn. A U-turn. Okay, we're doing that again. All right, good news. <laughs> Coming up on the program this hour, Natty Lovell of UBS with the S&P 500 on a five-day losing streak. Adam Posen of the Peterson Institute looking for a stronger U.S. dollar. And retired General Mark Kimmett as Israel reportedly retaliates against Iran. We begin with our top story. Middle East tensions and a hawkish Fed driving stocks to five days of losses. Natty Lovell of UBS. UBS writing this. We believe the economy will be able to handle delayed rate cuts and growth will remain above trend. During earnings season, we expect companies to beat estimates and look for profit growth to broaden out beyond the max seven. Nadia, I'm pleased to say, joins us now for more. Nadia, let's get into that. Price in power. I know Lisa wants to talk about P&G in just a moment. So let's start that conversation. Where is their pricing power right now? You know, we still think that there is a bit of price and power in the market. We are starting to see that dissipate, though. We have saw that, you know, echoed in some of the survey, whether it's Facebook or doing um, ISM. We're seeing some of that sort to come out of the market. But, um, you know, our sort of view on consumer staples, we think that it's neutral and Price and power um, is starting to dissipate um, among some of those companies. And this is why we have a neutral uh, rating on consumer staples. And we look more towards areas like tech and industrials, where we think that industrials will benefit from a pickup in manufacturing activity. So, Nadia, I'm looking at Tide Pods and how much they cost. And honestly, <laughs> you can spend $8 on 25 Tide Pods, at least in New York City. And this is one of the reasons why uh, Procter & Gamble doesn't seem to have any problems exceeding estimates, exceeding the, uh, the price targets that some equity analysts have on it, because they do have that pricing power and they pay a lot for it in terms of advertising because Tide is the main detergent. How much do you see this as an anomaly versus the mainstream, given the fact that we got very different types of commentary out of the beige book? I, I would say in terms of um, the price and power, look, like companies are noting that they're having a more difficult time in passing through those price increases and, and consumers are starting to push back on that. You know, there's certain brands, of course, that are going to be able to on the margin to to continue to do that. But even that is dwindling. At some point, the consumer will push back. And even with those, um, you know, brands, you'll start to see some potential trade down to um, store brands or private labels. And so I think companies are aware of that. They are doing the best that they can to protect margins. But that's something that we're all closely watching. Um, we do think that, um, you know, uh, for within consumer staples, that uh, those that are able to really drive volume growth and not so much rely on pricing are the ones that are going to stand out. And it tends to be those um, bigger, larger, stronger brands. It is striking to me, John, the fact that we heard Netflix really rely on price increases and 
Procter & Gamble is on track to boost its prices for a sixth consecutive year. That's really expensive Tide Pods. We saw what happened with inflation, and yes, it is very expensive Tide Pods, and I'm paying the price for them. We exactly. saw what happened in the last regime, Nadia, when we had inflation and upside surprises repeatedly and the Fed was chasing gear. We saw immense top-line growth at U.S. companies. Nadia, is there anything about this regime, this growth inflation policy mix, that might change that story, might threaten it? I don't think so, so much. I mean, you're still seeing top line growth um, uh, for S&P 500. We expect that to continue this quarter. I mean, we're looking for sort of low to make single digit top line growth. Um, and margins, the margins are still expanding because when, when you look through for the rest of the earnings season, we're looking for 7 to 9% EPS growth. And we think that that is going to continue for the rest of the year. The Breton, we are starting to expect that to be passed through to the rest of the market outside of the Magnificent Seven. This earnings season is is going to be important for the 493. You might recall the third quarter of last year was really when um, S&P aggregate earnings flipped black into the black. But a lot of that was, all of that really was driven by Magnificent 7 that was grown at 50%. So this could be the first quarter where we finally see the 493 irk out some earnings growth for the first time since fourth quarter of 2022. We think that by the time you get to the end of the year, that you see some conversions in growth between the MAG7 and the S&P 493. Um, we think that for the full year, you will get to 10% uh, or so uh, EPS growth. So um, uh, the top line should hold in there given the strong economy above trend growth. We're still looking for above trend growth, over 2% growth for the full year. And the margins, companies are able to hold on the margins because of well control expenses. We saw that from the banks this earnings season that um, expenses will well control. So even if they can't no longer put through price increases of, across some other companies, companies are looking to control expenses to be able to protect margins. Nadia, lots of attention on what's happening, developing in the Middle East at the moment, and lots of commentary on it. The latest from Peter Chair over at Academy Security saying this, Iran's attack last week was meant to be far more successful than it was. Downplaying this attack makes even more sense. Iran cannot afford to have another attack fail as miserably as the last one did and likely needs time to analyse what went wrong and what could be done differently in the future. There is a sense from people who specialise in this stuff, Nadia, that things are contained, that the threat of escalation is maybe a little subdued going into the weekend. Where are you and the team now on the energy markets and energy equities specifically as they are somewhat related to developments between Israel and Iran? Yeah, I mean, we did recently lift our expectations for Brent five five dollars across the board. Now looking for a ninety one dollars uh, for Brent for June and September. Um, we all recognize that there is a little bit of geopolitical risk premium built into oil prices, but our change is really due to fundamental factors. We have a modestly positive view on oil. We're expecting Brent to trade between eighty five and ninety five dollars, but demand remains intact. We are seeing surprisingly strong demand from OECD countries, particularly the European peripheries. Um, and as we look out, we think that, you know, um, Russia is going to shift the attention from export cuts and really more towards production cut. We're expecting a higher compliance from um, OPEC plus um, uh, production cuts. And, um, you know, production in the U.S. Uh, seems to be well controlled. We're not looking for any real growth there. You know, well, as it relates to um, equities, um, energy equities, we are neutral on the sector. But within the sector, we do continue to have a preference for, um, you know, uh, integrated oil and gas companies, just given their diverse business models and strong balance sheet. And we also like oil refiners because refining margins are elevated and um, product inventory globally um, does to still continue to remain low. So, those are the opportunities that we see within the um, energy sector, despite the fact that we're neutral. Nadia, the key words you said there is June. It's the summer months. What do you see for the year end? Is this just a temporary lift, potentially, in the energy markets? Uh, so, yes, of course, the upcoming summer season, the driving season and the cooling season. Um, uh, also, we do expect oh, oh, even as the voluntary cuts from OPEC um, plus is dialed back, we think that is going to be gradual and demand will remain strong. And so that should help um, oil prices stay in the, the high 80s um, into year end. We're not looking for $91 into year end. We're looking for um, uh, $87. 
Nadia, thank you. Always appreciate your input. Nadia Lovell there of UBS Global Wealth Management on the equity market, price in power, and what's happening with commodities right now. Let's get you an update on stories elsewhere this morning. Here is your Bloomberg Brief with Danny Berger. Hey, Danny. Hey, John. L'Oreal shares are up, surging this morning after the French cosmetics company reported better than expected earnings in first quarter sales. Strength in the European and North American markets helped offset a slowdown in shopping by Chinese travelers. Like for like sales at L'Oreal, which owns brands like Lancome, rose 9.4% in the first three months of the year, helped by strong demand for its mainstream consumer products. Fashion icon Giorgio Armani is hinting at some big changes for his business empire. The 89-year-old billionaire says that he won't rule out his firm someday combining with a bigger rival or pursuing an IPO. It's a shift for Armani, who has famously kept tight control of his company and rarely provided clues about what would happen and could happen if he leaves the company. The era of hockey in Arizona is coming to a close. NHL owners have approved the Coyotes' relocation to Salt Lake City, bringing the first professional hockey team to Utah. The team was purchased by Utah Jazz owner Ryan Smith for around $1 billion. The franchise will get a new name and play next season at the Delta Center in downtown Salt Lake City, which we will, they will share with the Jazz. That's your Bloomberg Brief. John. Danny, thank you. Appreciate it. In just a moment, we'll talk about comments from Secretary Blinken. They're serious comments, but I just want to talk about where those comments are coming from. Are they in Capri? Is yeah. that where they are? So the, G7, the G7's in Capri? The G7 presidency is, is the Italians, and they decided to have the foreign ministers meeting in Capri, and I cannot say, and before they went, I said, this is so tone deaf. Is this basically Greece? We're going to go to, like, Amazing. you know... That well, is amazing. Capri might be better than Greece. Don't tell the Greeks. To foreign that. ministers at Il Richo Beach Club, you enjoy yourself. Up next on the program, Israel striking back. It's a limited response that shows a signal that we can do more. But of course, the Iranians are spinning it as no, no, we we no. shot these things down. That conversation up next, live from Washington D.C., from the nation's capital, for our audience worldwide. Good morning. Coming off the back of five days of losses on the S&P 500, wrapping up the week with maybe another one. We're negative by 0.3%, but we are recovering. We're just about session highs on the S&P 500 right now. Yields are lower by four basis points, 458.99. The first thing we all checked when we woke up this morning, where's crude? I can tell you. It's lower by one full percentage point, 81.91 on WTI. Under surveillance this morning, Israel striking back. It's a limited response that shows a signal that we can do more. But, of course, the Iranians are spinning it as, no, no, we, we shot these things down. And one of the things that we have to think about is, what does the White House think? Because, of course, the White House said, don't do anything. Here's the latest this morning. Iranian state media confirming an attack by Israel earlier this morning, saying the drone operation failed. The IAEA saying there is no damage to the country's nuclear sites. Terry Haynes of Pangea Policy joins us around the table here in Washington. Good morning, Terry. Good morning, John. Difficult to have a conversation about this in many ways because yeah. we have such little detail yeah. about what's developing. Yeah. Let's assume these strikes have taken place based on reports. Yeah. I'm not sure the nature of them, the targets, if they, they came from drones or missiles. Let's talk about the White House, as Doug Redeker did there earlier on this morning. The degree of influence they have over events in that place, in that region. How much influence do they have? Well, not that much. Uh, and it's never been that much. You know, frankly, one of the reasons I go on about uh, it being the highest geopolitical risk in 50 years is very simply that the uh, that was the time of the Yom Kippur War, uh, when there were nuclear threats uh, from the Soviet Union and all the rest, combined with a lot of domestic uh, un uh, unrest and unease in the United States. And uh, and that's, that still happens today. But the United States is ha has given conflicting signals for the last three plus years, and that's taken a toll on its ability to affect events in the Middle East, frankly. Terry, conflicting signals for sure when it comes to this White House and how they communicate with Israel. This mm -hmm. morning you wake up and there's a fresh report in the Wall Street Journal that this administration wants to send another $1 billion worth of weapons to Israel on top of what Congress is debating. Yes. 
Politically, how fraught is that for Joe Biden? Uh, I think it's very fraught. Uh, the, the mixed messages here uh, send a very bad signal, and they send a bad signal at a time when Congress, frankly, is debating exactly what to do and how to do it. I imagine there's going to be some kind of congressional response about that. Uh, and it tends to undermine the president's own authority and ability to argue uh, what the foreign policy of the United States ought to be uh, to the Congress, much less anybody else. Congress is adding sanctions on Iranian oil. But we already have sanctions out of the executive branch. What Congress potentially may pass, would that actually go after the secondary, the issues, the refineries in China that are taking in this oil? Uh, I think that's potentially the case, yeah. Uh, what you're going to get from this, uh, fr from the consideration of the House bills uh, this week is a Senate response that I think is frankly going to take a couple of weeks to uh, to develop. Uh, and it's very much on the table, and certainly with Republicans, and I think probably a lot of centrist Democrats in the Senate as well, uh, You know, just how far and how much they want to direct the White House to do this. So the White House needs to actually continue to be in front front uh, of the troops instead of being behind them. Uh, that's a difficult there's problem. there's no appetite from the White House to enforce these sanctions. No, no, but uh, apparently not. I'm completely with you on that. But uh, I think there's a restiveness here in Washington uh, that something's going to have to happen sooner rather than later. When you speak with people in the market, what do you tell them about this administration's willingness and ability to sort of cap oil prices where they are? Because essentially, that's sort of the baked-in assumption that at some point there will either not be the enforcement of sanctions, as Anne-Marie was talking mm -hmm. about, or else you'll unleash the Strategic Petroleum Reserve heading into the election season. Uh, I think if you're, if you're relying on assumptions, you're relying on rather too much. Uh, I think there's a situation here where that's clearly what the White House wants to do, uh, but events, uh, I think, may overtake them on this. Uh, and there's a political, and let's not forget the, the kind of underlying political uh, advantage uh, for Republicans in all this as well. I mean, they, they can wrap themselves in, the, in, the, in not only in the flag, but also in a political uh, advantage that, uh, that will help them and disadvantage Biden uh, by, by, frankly, making it prices higher. Well, I'm looking right now at uh, the average uh, price of gasoline in the United States, and right now it's $3.68, which is the highest level going back to October, still not necessarily at the historic highs. Right. Is there a level that becomes politically toxic from a historical perspective for oil and gasoline? Um, I'd say roughly $4.50. Uh, the gallon. The reason why I say that is because I think it, very simply that I think uh, four dollars tends to be tolerable and it'll it'll jump up and down uh, within that range. Uh, but when you're getting when, when you get to an, an embedded four plus uh, or even five, as it was, say, in 2008, uh, I think that's intolerable. And that uh, that will that will snap back very negatively on Biden. To what extent do you think that's guiding policy, maybe even exclusively in the Middle East right now? Um, I think it's a big factor. I think it's probably, frankly a bigger factor than it ought to be, but that's, uh, you know, that's another whole discussion. Uh, the, uh, uh, the bottom line here is, though, uh, you know, what the president has to do is, is has to much more forcefully talk about American interests and, much less, uh, and spend much less time thinking about the political advantage, and that's going to be a difficult one. Well, if that's the case, then why isn't he going out and touting the fact that the United States is producing more than 13 million barrels a day? This is a record. No country in the world has ever reached, not Saudi Arabia, not Russia. It's astonishing, and yet he won't say it. Well, he won't say it because uh, a large parts of his base don't want those sorts of things to happen. Uh, and you've got a, a lot of... Uh a lot of mixed messages and a lot of strains on what the Biden energy policy is, right? I mean, he's, he won't talk about that. Uh, he was in Pittsburgh the other day uh, talking to the steel workers about uh, uh, the, the U.S. steel deal. Uh, but at the same time, 15 miles away is kind of the world capital of fracking. Uh, town that I happen to be from, by the way, but that, not that that matters. Um, the, the world capital of fracking, and he's not going anywhere into that area to talk to anybody about his LNG policies or why that's good, bad, or indifferent for the United States. The net net of this is uh, for his politics in Pennsylvania, I think, is very negative. Uh, for exactly that reason. He'll talk to one kind of constituency group but ignore a whole big swath of other issues, in this case energy. Can we just end on, you know, we're going to get this vote in, the, in Congress tomorrow. Yeah. 
TikTok, do you see it being banned before the election or not? Uh, I do before the election. Uh, I keep saying this and one day I'll be right. Do you think the White House will have that extension? Well, I think what will end up happening is, you know, in, in Congress, what tends to happen is if you're doing a, a package of bills, particularly, you focus on trying to maximize the votes on the stuff that you really want. In this case, it's the aid package stuff. The TikTok stuff, among other, is very important, but you don't have a consensus on that yet. Until you get the consensus on something, it's not going to happen. And I tend to think both the White House and Senate Democrats uh, want to play around with this particular ball of string a little while longer. Hey, Terry, you're one of the best. Appreciate it. It's great to catch up. John, thank you. Good to see you. And thanks for having us in your hometown. Oh, no, anytime. Terry Haynes of Pangea Policy. Coming up on this programme very shortly, we'll catch up with Adam Poston of the Peterson Institute on why he's expecting a stronger US dollar. That conversation just around the corner. Equity futures on the S&P 500 recovering just a touch. We're down by a quarter of 1% on the S&P 500. In the bond market, Treasury yields are lower to close out the week. They're just about higher through Thursday, almost across the curve. On a 10-year, we're back down to about 460. Elsewhere in the commodity market, crude down by basically one percentage point now. WTI is 81.93, backing away even with reported strikes from Israel on Iran overnight. Live from Washington, this is Bloomberg. Things really are improving as the session grows older. Equities off the lows even more. Negative by 0.2% on the S&P 500. Check out the Nasdaq down about a third of 1%. Through Thursday, coming into Friday, five-day losing streak on the S&P. The longest since somewhere in October, mid to end of October. So quite a stretch of gains before we got this stretch of losses. In the bond market, two-year, 10-year, 30-year, looking at a two-year, getting close to 5% again just in the last 24 hours, backing away by two basis points today to 496.64. I want to stick on the front end and talk about some of the voices we've heard in the last day or so. Things are starting to change. Just the conversation. I think we've said repeatedly throughout this morning, it's not the conclusion that's changed, Lisa. It's the conversation they're having. To hear the New York Fed president, John Williams, feel the need even to have a conversation about the prospect of higher interest rates if they need to, tells you how much has shifted in the last few weeks. Dare I say they sound more hopeful than confident. Can I just say that? Because essentially, that's kind of where we're at, where they're basically talking less about we are definitely sufficiently restrictive we think we are sufficiently restrictive to bring down inflation. We have to have more, uh, more evidence. We're not totally confident based on the evidence that we've had. This, and yes, you can call it a U-turn, but I think it's actually, they thought they were making a pivot on better data, and that influenced some of the inflation, and now they have to re retract from some of that. And now they're pivoting again, potentially. Another thing, if you're saying potentially there might be a world in which we would hike rates, that means that they're implying that these are not bumps in the road. This is a trend when it comes to fighting inflation, potentially. A hot print story to start the year. Three of them. Three bumps in a road, if you want to call them that. We'll have that conversation in just a moment. Let's turn to the commodity board and look at crude. WTI and Brent as well. Pulling back by something like 1% so far this morning. We're down nine tenths on WTI. A break of 82 at 81.97. Under surveillance this morning, Israel retaliating against Iran following last week's missile and drone attack. Iran state media acknowledging the attack, saying the drone operation failed. Israel has yet to comment. And the details, I guess we're still pretty light on details at the moment, Anne-Marie, as we try and work out just what happened overnight. I think the most important thing is whether or not this was a missile or, missile or a drone, where it hit. It's Isfayan. This is a place with a tremendous amount of capacity for how they build drones. This is, they have Air Force Base here. It is also where they have nuclear facilities. So the message from Israel to Iran is, we know where your nuclear capability is, and we have the capacity to hit it. This is a warning, ready to take the temperature down, but we can do it if we feel the need to. General Kim is going to be joining us in about 10 minutes' time to have this conversation about whether Israel has sufficiently demonstrated the capability it wanted to demonstrate with these strikes overnight. I want to talk about a single name. Check out Netflix. Falling in the pre-market, the company adding more than 9 million subscribers in the first quarter. Sounds good, doesn't it? So why is the stock down 5%? It was almost double estimates, Bramo. 
It's the guidance going forward and the lack of disclosures, which our very own Geetha Raghunathan of Bloomberg Intelligence seems to suggest is responsible for a five percentage point move in the pre-market. Three points here. First, Netflix was up 25 percent before this. So how high was the bar and how little did the disappointment have to be to get this kind of move? Number two, the fact that there is less of a focus on the expansion of subscribers and more on price increases speaks to where we are in this cycle, which I find fascinating. And number three, they are not alone with that. The fact you can lump in Procter and Gamble talking about uh, six consecutive uh, six consecutive years of price increases. I had to double check that. I couldn't believe it. That's what we're talking about. An additional three percent this year. This speaks to an inflationary moment that has not been killed off yet. I think that's fascinating. The stock is down by five point three percent at the pre-market. Looking at Netflix. Let's turn to the hawkish Fed speak. It's been ramping up over the last few days. Minneapolis Fed President Neil Kashkari saying they could hold rates steady. All year. New York Fed President John Williams saying a rate hike is not his baseline, but leaving the door open if the data warrants it. Adam Poston of the Peterson Institute expecting a quote further secular rise in the US dollar against the other major currencies to get bigger over the next year, as the Fed will have reason to hold off cutting interest rates. Adam's with us here in Washington. Adam, good morning to you. Welcome to Washington. Thank you very much for having us, sir. Can we talk about the lack of cooperation and maybe even the complaints that you've heard this week about the strength of the U.S. dollar? How loud are those complaints? Well, after a long time of silence, even though the dollar kept rising, we saw yesterday Janet Yellen and her counterparts from Japan and Korea do an open mouth operation. Um, open mouth, sometimes stuff comes out, sometimes stuff doesn't. Um, you know, there's very big fundamentals here. The Japanese economy is doing very well by its standards, but and potentially could be raising rates, but it's not the U.S. Um, Korea has a lot of positive fundamentals, but the point is if even Japan and Korea are losing ground against the dollar, this is a wave. And my fear is it just goes up from here. And their problems get bigger? Political problems and economic problems. More political than economic, but yeah. Can we talk about the political and the economic problems? First, the political. What would be the political problems that come about off the back of this move? So it's probably not going to affect the election directly, but it sets things up for bigger trade deficits, which again is not necessarily a bad thing. But if Trump, as he stated, and Lighthizer view that as a real problem, or if over the course of the campaign the Biden administration starts talking about it and decides it's a real problem, then you have a, a need to deal with it. Uh, and tariffs, whatever their lack of virtues on their own merits, um, they don't fix trade deficits. That was demonstrated amply over the last seven years. So you end up back in, if you care about the trade deficit, if you care about the dollar, and most importantly, you care about what that does to credit conditions. So Lisa's rightly talking about monetary policy isn't as tight as the Fed thought. If you have a very strong dollar and money flowing into the dollar, that further loosens credit conditions. You mentioned the fiscal deficit. The IMF pretty much put out a warning to the United States almost. It's too loose. We prepare it to be looser this year because it's an election year. And there's no path forward for fiscal discipline. How much is the U.S. the biggest problem when you're talking to officials from around the world? I mean, the U.S. is the biggest problem, Emory, mostly because of our unreliability in international commitments and the potential for unwinding even further those commitments and a lot of self-dealing. So a lot of it's on the trade front, the security front, unreliability like with Ukraine funding, unreliability with, with trade deals with the USMCA. But in terms of the dollar and the fiscal, I was glad to see the IMF getting loud because sometimes they are scared to do real surveillance on China, US, the big con economies. And you know, we got open-ended fiscal problems. We've got this threat that by end of 2025, the 2017 tax cuts expire. So whoever's in Congress, whoever's in the White House has to make some deal. There's no historical precedent for letting tax cuts expire, as you well know, and then having them jump 7%. Um, but the nature of that deal is almost certainly not going to include much tax increase. And without tax increase, I don't know how you get the budget deficit down. You mentioned something. Let's go there. U.S. Okay. monetary policy. You wrote, it's not that tight at all. Are you saying that it needs to be significantly higher in terms of the benchmark rate in order to get inflation back down even close to 2%? I think it does have to be higher if you want to go to 2%. I had, I'm actually calm with the Fed letting it stay roughly where it is and say it's a two-sided risk, as John Williams started to say. I'd be okay with that. 
but I do believe that the monetary conditions are not tight. Let me take you back, Lisa, a year ago, February. February, March, people like us, which is a funny category, but anyway. <laughs> um, people, Speak for yourself. <laughs> fed, fed nerds. Um, we're talking about the fact that Fed had tightened, you know, X hundred basis points, and it really wasn't affecting the economy that much. And then came SVB, and everybody got distracted. But if you go back to the first quarter of 2023, that was the talk. And I kept saying, a few other people kept saying, look, credit conditions are what matter, not what the Fed funds rate. So John Williams, Lori Logan from Fed Dallas were coming out about six months ago, five months ago, talking about, oh, my God, there might be a recession because the interest rate goes up as inflation comes down. And I and a few other people kept saying, don't obsess with the Fed funds rate. Credit spreads are incredibly narrow. So anyway, it's less about the Fed has to do something different because the numbers are okay unless you really care about getting to 2 percent. But the extent to which it's tight, I think, is way overestimated. And you've been talking for a long time about how they need to have a higher target, even yeah. around 3 percent. So this uh, coheres with that idea. We keep going back to the pivot, and we can talk right. about the pivot of the pivot and U-turn and all that, but it, let's not. I think there is a key question here of whether it was a policy error for Fed Chair Powell to enunciate the possibility and the likelihood of rate cuts this year back at the end of last. I think it was. I, I think it was. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a communications error, and it goes with, I think, two things that have generally been suboptimal, as we say. Uh, first, they're too busy trying to guide the markets in a decision-to-decision in a -decision way. And second, they're too reactive to data. So if they had a bit more structure, they'd just say, we've gotten it to here. You can say, I'm data-dependent, but you can say what, why you're data-dependent instead of just saying, I'm data-dependent, but I think I'm going to do this. Do the politics matter? Does the election matter? Could you give us some colour on that, your impression of what people are saying here in Washington? Because you know what the story is in Wall Street. On Wall Street, there is a belief that there is this window in July, right. and if they don't go through it, that door slams shut, and it doesn't reopen until the end of the year. Window for essentially all for constructive, a for yeah. a rate cut. Yeah, I think, I think that's fair. I've been saying for a while. If they can avoid it, even when I thought they were going to cut in June, um, I, uh, March, I never thought March, I always thought June. I, I thought they would try to avoid cutting again so close to the election. So, but I don't think that's big picture, really what matters. What matters is U.S. is essentially sidelined itself for the next year. Um, we don't know what the fiscal policy is going to be. The monetary policy is on hold, which is reasonable, but therefore not reacting to things. And, you know, foreign policy, which you all also cover, is, of course, dominating matters. But if we, there's so many unknowns then to 2025. How can the Fed do anything? If we get 60% blanket tariffs on Chinese imports and a 10% tariff wall for every single good coming into the United States, inflation may potentially skyrocket, which yeah. is what every economist is saying. How do you as the Federal Reserve then cut rates going into potentially that? I completely agree with you, and I'm glad, Emory, you're saying that out there because it is a true statement. Tariffs mean inflation, no matter how you cut it. And if you do broad across the board tariffs, even more than the anti-China tariffs, you're talking 1% to 2% jump in inflation almost immediately, and another percent probably, somewhere between half and one percent the next year before you even get bass on effects. So what does the Fed do? Now, of course, the Fed doesn't want to be seen as judging trade policy. So if this is a one-off, they can say, well, it's just a one-off. But they certainly should be saying that there's a risk of an upward spiral if you're putting that on top of inflation that's already above target if you haven't changed your target, and it's already low unemployment. I agree. I mean, I think they should be warning about that. So when you just take a step back and put all this together, there's a real question of how vulnerable the financial system is to some of the shocks that come yeah. from higher inflation, and higher rates. We did speak yesterday with Jonathan Pingle of UBS, mm -hmm. who talked about the potential for the Federal Reserve to raise rates to six and a half percent next year if inflation stays above three percent in a persistent way throughout the rest of this year. What's the rate at which you start to see things break, both on the yield space side as well as on the dollar? Here's where I'm probably more optimistic, Lisa. I think what we've seen over the last year, two years, is how much bank capital, household balance sheets, risk aversion matter, and the households having a lot of savings. So, you know, we had much less breakage from these rate increases than we've had in the past. So I think talking to the financial and 
and monetary officials who were in Washington this week, I think they're rightly, even though it's boring because they never do anything, talking about non-financial, <laughs> non-bank financial intermediaries, what we used to call shadow banks, because right. we don't have transparency into what part of the credit system is in there and how risky is it and how they reprice it. And so if I'm worried about something breaking, that's where I worry about it breaking. I think what we're talking about is potentially a further hike in the dollar, and that going back to where we started, that is not sustainable long term. And then if you're busy having been annoying to all your allies and putting tariffs on them, it's a little hard to then say, oh, please do something cooperatively to bring down the dollar. Yep. Can we finish on trade? Yep. But a theme of the program over the last couple of days for us. Who in this city is left fighting for free trade? Who's leading that fight anymore? I left? wouldn't say we're leading it, but the Peterson Institute is one of the only ones who are trying. We're trying to feed people the facts about what happens to American households, what happens to inflation, what happens to growth of the tariffs. The facts about on the macro side, you're getting a stronger and stronger dollar, which is distortionary and which is going to overshoot. But if it's like 85, when you're putting tariffs on people, and also when you're not letting them invest in the U.S., you, you can't unwind this. Remember, in the mid-'80s, when everyone was so concerned about Japan um, and the dollar shot up hugely because you had loose fiscal, tight money, so a lot of echoes of today, um, part of the way we got out of it was we got the Plaza Accord. Yeah. But part of the way we got the Plaza Accord was also politically Japanese and other foreign countries had their multinationals invest a lot in the U.S. So there's hundreds of thousands of Toyota and Honda workers now in the U.S., we're not letting the Chinese do that. So you're making it even more complicated to unwind this if we get into this mess. It's a complicated mess already, some people might say. Adam, thank you so much for your time today. We appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Adam Poston of the Peterson Institute for International Economics on a whole range of issues. Equity futures continue to recover. We're down about a tenth of 1% on the S&P 500. Let's get you an update on stories elsewhere. Here is your Bloomberg Brief with Danny Berger. Hey, Danny. Hey, John. Netflix crushed street expectations for subscribers and yet, shares are lower by more than 5% this morning. I caught up with CFRA's Ken Leon earlier on Bloomberg Brief, which you can watch every morning at 5 a.m. And he said that he's confused why the streamer would stop reporting subscriber metrics. We're just perplexed. Why wouldn't you give subscriber numbers? They're just a little less confident um, and uh, don't want to surprise on the downside. The analysts are saying maybe this is a more mature company maybe a more mature company. But as for the details, Netflix says it would stop reporting both paid quarterly membership and revenue per subscriber in the first quarter, starting in the first quarter of 2025. American Express be earning its expectations, yet is down 1.6%. Revenue jumped in the first quarter, 11%. Amex says it's still attracting high spending, high credit quality customers. Cards with a fee made up over 70% of their new accounts. 12 jurors and one alternative have been selected for Donald Trump's trial in New York. It's his first trial and the first ever criminal trial against a former president. Opening arguments in the case could start as soon as Monday. Trump faces three other criminal prosecutions. He's denied wrongdoing and claims the cases are part of a political witch hunt against him. That's your brief. John. Danny, thank you. I'm next on the program. Israel retaliates. We're committed to Israel's security. We're also committed to de-escalating, uh, to trying uh, to bring uh, this tension to a, to a close. A conversation just around a corner, live from Washington. This is Bloomberg. Live from Washington, good morning and welcome to the program in the nation's capital for the IMF World Bank spring meetings. Equity futures right now negative by 0.2% on the S&P 500. Treasury still steady, yields are lower by three basis points, 460.22. And even with some tension in the Middle East, we've got crude down by half of 1%, 82.34 on WTI. Under surveillance this morning, Israel retaliates. We're committed to Israel's security. We're also committed to de-escalating uh, to trying uh, to bring uh, this tension to a, to a close. You'll see soon in the G7 statement a commitment to hold Iran to account, uh, to account for its destabilizing activities, 
uh, holding it to account by uh, degrading its missile and drone capabilities. Here's the latest this morning. Israel launching overnight airstrikes near Iran's third largest city. Iranian state media claiming nearby nuclear facilities are safe and saying the drone attack failed. Officials from both countries appearing to downplay the severity of the attack amid concerns over the risks of a wider conflict. Retired Army Brigadier General Mark Kimmett saying Iran, quote, does not have the capability for a response to an Israeli counter-response. General Kimmett, I'm pleased to say, is with us in Washington. General, good morning to you, sir. Morning. Do you believe, based on the reports that you've seen this morning and heard, that Israel has managed to at least convey superior capability to the Iranians? Well, they've certainly uh, displayed capability. Uh, I think the Israelis held back considerably. Uh, the fact that they could hit near Esfahan nuclear reactor, I think, was more of a message than it was a capability. And I think at this point, there's less chance of escalation than there was 24 hours ago. Would you consider this episode closed? Uh, my opinion doesn't matter. They've got to decide if this episode is closed. For me, uh, it would appear what they're trying to do is go back to the status quo, which is a war in the shadows, not a war in the, uh, in the open that they've had ever since the assassination of the Quds Force officers inside of the Damascus uh, embassy. How do you go back to a status quo, though, when red lines have been absolutely evaporated this week? especially considering the fact that we had drones and missiles coming from Iranian soil to Israel. There's no red lines. It's all been pushed. Yeah, I think I th that's a very good question, Emory. I think the fact that uh, it appears one of the targets of the Iranian attack was the Demona nuclear facility in Israel. And the fact that the Israelis went after a target near the uh, Natanz nuclear reactors, which is the center of the Iranian programs, I think both of them have got to the cliff, they've looked over the edge, and perhaps this is a chance for them to pull back. What do you make of what we've seen from the U.S. response, particularly when they said it was a massive success, and it was, in terms of their capability to shoot down all these missiles and drones that were heading towards Israel? Yep. But the fact that it happened means that where was the deterrence from the West? Uh, I think it's very surprising to see that the Iranians took the... Uh, uh, level of attack that they did to respond to the Syria uh, targeting. Uh, we had not seen that before. That was far more than we had even seen after the targeting of Soleimani. Uh, by comparison, the Iranian response to the American uh, operation against Soleimani was, was almost muted. Uh, we had a lot of soldiers get injured in that, but none were killed. But compared to the response uh, against uh, this recent incident in Syria, I think everybody's surprised. And at this point, everybody's trying to get the genie back into the bottle. When you talk about the genie into the bottle, are you talking about Iran representing strength at a time where an attack that exceeded all previous ones ultimately failed? Uh, that's the right way to put it. Uh, in many ways, Iran showed their weakness, not their strength, by doing this. Uh, but remember, they were not trying to achieve a military victory in this. What they were really trying to, the, the, the victory they were trying to win was a soft power victory, to show that they are the head of the axis of resistance, to show that they would not stand for what Israel did in a foreign country. We're talking about the also coalition that was yeah. somewhat unprecedented of the U.S. and the U.K. and France, but also of Jordan and Saudi Arabia. Sure. How much was that sort of loosely uh, cobbled together coalition on uh, just this particular issue, almost contingent on a resolution to what's going on in Gaza? Yeah, I, I think, first of all, it's important to understand that we have put together this coalition for over two decades now. It's been slow effort. We've tried to bring the entire region into a centralized air defense uh, capability. Uh, we are, the Abraham Accords took care of some of the political issues, the military issues are being worked out. Uh, I think that this demonstrates to the region why they want to uh, work together more for the defense of the region, and both militarily and diplomatically. To me, this builds on the Abraham Accords. And uh, I would certainly hope that this continues. Well, for the Abraham Accords to continue, we really need to see Saudi Arabia and Israel sign a deal. And that can't happen without a resolution in Gaza, which I want to ask you about. Where does this leave Gaza, given the fact that we've kind of had this sideshow between Tehran and Jerusalem? 
Yeah, I'm really glad you call it a sideshow because in many ways, Emory, it is a sideshow. Everybody seems to think it's the main effort, but no, it's the sideshow. I, I don't think that uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu has slowed down one moment from his attack plans into Rafa. I think the real question is what happens the day after Rafa falls, the day after the Israelis declare that Hamas is no longer an effective fighting force and we've destroyed the infrastructure. Then the hard work of governance is going to come in, which we've talked about for quite some time. And until there's a solution on governance, there's really no solution on the two-state uh, question. General, we need a few more hours to complete this conversation. We don't have it. Thank you very much for joining us, sir. We appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. That was retired Army Brigadier General Mark Kimmett there on the latest between Israel and Iran. Coming up in the next hour of Bloomberg Surveillance, we'll catch up with TPW's Jay Piloski, U.S. Trade Representative Catherine Tai, Unicredit's Eric Nielsen, and sitting down with the IMF First Deputy Managing Director, Gita Gopinath. Bramo's going to run across to IMF HQ in the next couple of minutes. Yeah, it wasn't gloomy enough for me today, so I've got to leave. How gloomy you know? are you going to make it with Gita? No, not at all. She actually wrote a brilliant paper that was really interesting, talking about what the fragmentation currently looks like, what that might mean about inflation, but we've been really wondering... What is the IMF's role in an era where so many people are rejecting the concept of free trade? A lack of cooperation backsliding into what Jay Pulaski has ultimately called a tripolar world. China, Europe and ultimately the United States pushing forward with industrial policy, protectionism, tariffs and subsidies. So this at this point, this is the bastion of free trade. Yeah. How do you deal with that? I'm not sure if it is anymore. Equity futures on the S&P 500 negative by 0.1 percent. The third hour of Bloomberg surveillance. Coming up next. The basic fact is growth has surprised persistently, you know, for the last year. The U.S. is quite boomy right now. That does not seem like an economy that has restrictive monetary policy. From just a growth perspective, we're exceeding expectations, but people are still nervous. The question is, for the next 10, 15 years, is inflation at 25 or 3 percent? And the economy is perfectly fine with that and can continue to grow. The U.S. is performing in an exceptional way. The question is, is that sustainable or temporary? This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Jonathan Ferro, Lisa Abramowitz, and Anne Marie Hordern. Live from the nation's capital here in Washington, D.C., for our audience worldwide, good morning, good morning. The IMF World Bank spring meetings continue in D.C. Bramo's running off to IMF HQ. She's going to catch up with the first deputy manager director, Gita Gopinath. That interview taking place in about 45 minutes from now. If you want to know where the price action is, I can start with equities. Equities right now on the S&P 500, negative by 0.1% on the S&P. But the focus is in the commodity market and crude is a lot lower, both on WTI and on Brent. We're negative here by three quarters of 1%. Israel said it would respond, and based on reports we got overnight, they've responded. Absolutely. What we've seen is a retaliation from Israel on Iran. And what's key here, Jonathan, is the fact that the city they struck. This is Isfayan. This is where there are nuclear facilities in Iran. So what Israel was trying to show was, OK, we're not trying to cause damage, but we are trying to send a message. What is most instructive, though, in fact, informing perhaps West move in the commodity market this morning, is what they didn't hit nuclear sites, and it's Iran's response to it, which at the moment is basically this failed and we don't need to respond to it. And in Iran, they're not even, according to local press, having a national security committee, which means that they want to put this to the side, which means we do have a sense of de-escalation in the region at the moment, potentially a bow on this specific episode, which is the fact why we're seeing crude pull back but doesn't mean that we could potentially not see skirmishes in the future, which is why maybe is almost a calm before a storm. So earlier this morning, we had two basic questions. And the first one was whether Israel had demonstrated superior capability to Iran. A lot of people would conclude perhaps they have. The second question would be, should this reinforce Israeli deterrence to Iran? Do you think it has based on what we've seen? I think given the city they've struck, potentially they are getting to that point. And I think Iran potentially really had this barrage, 300 missiles and drones, 99 percent of them were struck down. Israel sent a few to one specific city. It was a clear message. 
that the Israelis were trying to send to the Iranians. Brent crude down by six tenths of one percent. Let's check out the price action for you. Starting with equities on the S and P 500. Equities negative by zero point one percent. Five day losing streak on the S and P could well become six, but we're doing some work to make sure that doesn't happen. Yields are lower by four basis points on a ten year four fifty nine nineteen. Yields pulling back from the year to date highs struck over the last week or so. And as you move on WTI, we're back in the low eighties, heading towards another weekly loss on crude, $82 and down by nine-tenths of 1%. Coming up this hour, we'll catch up with U.S. Trade Representative Catherine Tai on Biden's 2024 trade agenda. Uni credits Eric Nielsen on global central bank divergence and Gita Gopinath of the IMF on what she calls the risk of an economic cold war. We begin with our top story, markets on edge, the S&P heading for its third straight week of losses. But TPW's Jay Pulaski remaining bullish, saying this, we remain happy to trade rate cuts for earnings growth. We we are impressed at how well the equity market has moved ahead, shifting gears from the AI tech-led Magnificent Seven to a much more cyclical and commodity-driven advance. Jay, I'm pleased to say, is with us for more. Jay, here in Washington, D.C., you've heard it. They're talking about the tepid 20s over at the IMF. Have you got a different view on things? Yes, John, uh, very much so. I mean, the IMF meetings, historically, it's like Davos. Um, you know, you want to fade the consensus a year ago. The IMF meetings were uh, ultra gloomy, 100 percent view of recession. And guess what? Over the last 12 months, uh, equities, equity, uh, global equities up 18 percent. Bonds represented by the ag down 4 percent. So, yeah, we'll fade the tepid 20s. And we're more in the roaring 20s camp. And we wrote about this recently in the shape of things to come. Our view is that the 2023 to 2027 period globally is going to be very much like the 1995 to 1999 period in the U.S., which was a period of uh, above trend growth, better productivity, low inflation, real wage gains, and a pretty good environment for risk assets. We think the difference this time is it's going to be global. What tells you, Jay, that it's going to be global? What's guiding that assessment at the moment? Yeah, John, I mean, you touched on it, and thank you for the, uh, for the reference to our tripolar world thesis, which is now almost 15 years old. And it's funny, I've been thinking about it a lot over the last couple of weeks. And when we originally wrote up the thesis, it was the idea that every, each region, Europe, Asia, and the Americas, could self-finance, self-produce, and self-consume. And what we've seen, particularly over the last five years or so with COVID, is an acceleration of that process as supply chains regionalize, as the response to COVID climate and conflict drives spending. We've shifted from a monetary policy world to a fiscal led policy world to a point now where AI and the uh, climate and EV revolution is really uh, you know, fast forwarding this process. And you can just see it uh, by the AI companies in China raising money internally. You can see it, the same thing happening in Europe. President Biden's uh, push for the CHIPS Act, Infrastructure Act, Inflation Reduction Act. We are in a period where uh, even tariffs, uh, you and Lisa talked about tariffs. Tariffs are forcing companies to produce in each region. You're having the Chinese coming to the U.S., producing uh, EVs in the U.S. to avoid the tariffs. You're having the same thing happen in Europe. Uh, and so what you're doing is you're driving a period of uh, investment in each region that is very much pro-growth. And the trade-off is, yes, we're probably going to have uh, slightly higher inflation. And yes, we're going to have higher interest rates. But to us, that's not that bad a problem as long as we get the earnings growth that we anticipate. And by the way, consensus calls for three years, 24, 25, and 26, to have uh, double-digit earnings growth in the U.S. Add to that buybacks, and you have an environment where I don't think, uh, or I do think, sorry, the risk-reward for uh, equities is uh, pretty compelling. So, Jay, you've offered us the framework, the way to think about the world. Let's talk about the vehicle to invest in. How would you approach this? What's the optimal way of expressing that in capital markets? Yeah, again, John, thank you. It's, it's right on point um, because I really am starting to think that investors really need to have a tripolar world 
kind of investment uh, portfolio, meaning they need to be exposed to the growth opportunities that are manifesting in each region. And therefore, you know, if you're U.S. centric, you need to be looking elsewhere. And I'll give you a reference point. Uh, the IMF uh, just put out its growth forecast for the next five years, and they noted that China is going to be responsible itself, by itself, for about 25 percent of the global growth over the next five years. So you're telling me that as a global investor, you're not going to be invested in China, which represents 25 percent of the global growth over the next five years? You, you need to be invested there. And today is a wonderful opportunity to do so, given that Chinese assets are selling at massive discounts, particularly in things like the tech sector. So to us, one perfect example right now, very quickly, is you have a two tech stack divide in the world, and a US-led one and a China-led one. China companies are going to dominate the China tech stack. It's multiples of the size of the US tech stack selling at a 70% discount. We love that idea. Another idea is the AI revolution is going to require tons of energy. And therefore, we want to be exposed to both the semiconductor cycle and the commodity cycle. And then finally, to put a bow on all of this, is we want to be exposed uh, to the emerging markets, which is a uh, beneficiary historically of a global growth upswing. And again, it's been a tremendous laggard so you were buying assets that are selling at 30 to 40 year lows versus the United States. And so those are just a handful of the opportunities that we see. We see lots of opportunities around the world, John. Jay, you're in the same company as Ed Yardeni, who we spoke to yesterday. He had a 60 percent probability chance since the 1920s, 20 percent 1990s. But then there was another 20 percent, he said, that it could be the 1970s. How do you prepare a portfolio for downside risk if this was, say, the 1970s? Yeah, no, Dr. Ed is, uh, we're right uh, in the same uh, boat with him, and uh, we think that's good company. We respect his work a lot. Look, I don't think it's anything like the 70s. I was just thinking about that when you were talking in the lead-in about what's going on in the Middle East, right? To me, the Middle East is the least important it's been in, the, in 50 years, right? In the 70s, the problem was, the oil shock and oil prices quadrupled. That's not going to happen today. And here's a couple of reasons why it's not going to happen. One, most importantly, the U.S. is now the biggest oil producer in the world. <laughs> Second is there are five to six million barrels of production capacity today that is on the sidelines in Saudi and elsewhere as they try to push the price up. And third, and most perhaps most importantly, you have the EV revolution gradually eating away at uh, fossil fuel demand uh, as we see manifesting itself uh, on almost a daily basis. And so I don't I, I see the risk of a 70s type world being very minimal. Having said that, we do love commodities. Our our asset allocation is we're overweight equities, we're overweight commodities, we're massively underweight uh, fixed income. We have zero U.S. Treasury exposure. We haven't had any exposure for years uh, because we're in this view of a stronger global growth environment than many uh, expect. I'll give you a call when we get back to 5%. I'll try and sally some. Jay, it's good to hear from you. <laughs> Jay Pulaski, a TPW. Jay, thank you, sir. It's interesting to hear that as the Middle East is probably the most unstable it's been in years, to hear someone say it's the least significant from a commodity perspective in decades. It's pretty shocking. Also, you have to think of the fact that there's cables underneath the Red Sea that can really hurt telecommunications. So I don't really buy into the fact that the Middle East is insignificant. Saudi Arabia, though, can also add millions of barrels right now to this market. And that would drastically change where we are in the oil price. So it, maybe it's not as important in the 1970s, but it's still very important. Crude right now down by 0.7 percent. Let's give an update on stories elsewhere this morning. Here is your Bloomberg brief. Here's Danny Berger. Hey, Danny. Hey, John. Yields are lower, but the rally has faded throughout the morning with the ebb and flow of geopolitical risk. Mads Peterson of Human Edge Investment Technology told me earlier on Bloomberg brief that now is one of the best opportunities in the past 10 years to buy bonds. The U.S. Treasury at this level is starting to look extremely interesting. Um, the, the whole curve looks looks good. You, it's the best, probably the best time in a decade to use U.S. government bond as a long time as a class diversification.
and you can watch Bloomberg Brief every morning at 5 a.m. Eastern. Paramount shares up 7.5% in the pre-market after a report that Sony and Apollo are considering a joint bid for the company. Paramount is in exclusive talks with Skydance, but the proposal has generated significant investor pushback, according to the New York Times. Tesla shares lower in the pre-market trade, one and a third percent, and recalled almost 4,000 cyber trucks to repair accelerator pedals that can dislodge, become trapped, and cause a vehicle to unintentionally accelerate. Tesla has told customers it will fix the pedals free of charge. That's your brief, John. Danny, thank you. Appreciate it. Up next on the program, Biden taking on China. The Chinese government has poured state money into Chinese steel companies, pushing them to make so much steel as much as possible, subsidized by the Chinese government. They're not competing. They're cheating. They're cheating. And we've seen the damage here in America. That conversation is coming up next, a special conversation with Catherine Tai, the U.S. Trade Representative. That's just around the corner, live from Washington. Good morning. Live from Washington, counting you down to the opening bell, about one hour and 14 minutes away. Equity futures on the S&P 500 shaping up as follows, almost erasing the losses of this morning. We're basically unchanged on the S&P. Yield still a little bit lower, down four basis points on a 10-year, 458.78. Under surveillance this morning, Biden taking on China. America is still working out, work out, compete as long as they have fair competition. But for too long, the Chinese government has poured state money into Chinese steel companies pushing them to make so much steel as much as possible, subsidized by the Chinese government. They're not competing. They're cheating. They're cheating. And we've seen the damage here in America. Here's the latest this morning. President Biden calling for higher tariffs on Chinese steel in a bid to shore up the U.S. steel sector. China slamming the potential restrictions, saying the U.S. is, quote, arbitrarily slapping tariffs on Chinese products. Ambassador Catherine Tai, U.S. Trade Representative, joins us now from New York. Ambassador, wonderful to have you with us on the program. We've some, called it done a, a role reversal. You're in New York and we're down in Washington. We'll make this work properly next time. Ambassador, this is a topic we've been talking about for a long, long time. Chinese overcapacity. We all know about the China shock. We all studied it. It obliterated manufacturing bases in places like the United States of America. Can I just give you a few minutes just to sort of lay the ground for us? What's changed and what's new about what's developing right now? Well, I'd be delighted to. It's wonderful to be here with all of you. You're absolutely right about the China shock. And um, uh, it's, become, uh, it's become an established set of facts as we look back on the last several decades of China's emergence as um, uh, an economic powerhouse in the world. As you've seen the growth of the Chinese economy, what you've also seen is the negative impacts on other economies like uh, that of the United States and, of course, uh, the um, uh, industrial erosion that you've seen here, the manufacturing capacity loss, isn't just uh, limited to the United States. You see it in other advanced economies. You also see it in uh, developing countries as well. But um, to your point, a lot of what we're seeing right now is not new. Uh, the China shock continues. We've seen it in the sectors steel and aluminum. We've seen it in solar panels. 20 years ago, the United States, several other countries had uh, growing economies and industries around solar panels. Um, the Chinese double down on their um, what we call non-market practices, their state investment in a strategic emerging sector. And what you've seen is something we've seen over and over again, uh, creation of um, uh, excess capacity, um, overproduction that brings down prices. It's a kind of predatory pricing practice uh, worldwide that has driven out producers in other economies, leaving the Chinese economy having cornered the market in production. Uh, right now, uh, we're still 85% uh, reliant on Chinese production and supply in solar panels. We've also seen it in um, uh, batteries. We're seeing it now in EVs and uh, critical minerals is another example. So um, what you see us doing with respect to uh, steel um, is actually uh, responding to 
um, a set of pressures that have been building over a couple decades. Um, on the steel point in particular, I wanted to I wanted to really uh, enforce that um, what you heard President Biden uh, talk about earlier this week was to call on me as the U.S. trade representative to consider uh, increasing yeah. the existing tariffs on Chinese steel imports. But we know that the challenge with Chinese overcapacity and excess production is a, a world economy challenge. The scale of the Chinese economy and its ability to manufacture and produce will depress prices worldwide. It infects the global economy and global prices. And so what you've seen is as well, the maintenance of the uh, global steel tariffs and aluminum tariffs, but you also see us as the Biden administration evolving out of uh, that particular framework. You see us in particular taking leadership role with the European Union. Over the last two years, we have been engaged in intensive negotiations for a new framework, a, a global sustainable steel and aluminum um, agreement that we are working on to uh, uh, address not just the excess capacity pressures, but also to try to create incentives for cleaner production and cleaner trade in steel and aluminum. So, Ambassador, if I can jump in, if we can focus just on steel, because we've got so much to unpack there. Let's take steel. And we both know how complex this is. And I can share some numbers with our audience, certainly not for your benefit. Direct Chinese imports, as you know, the estimate is something like 0.6 percent of total steel demand in the United States. The problem is a lot of this is going through Mexico. So, Ambassador, a question I asked, heard someone ask recently is how do we make them eat it? So how can you address what is happening in Mexico? How do we stop the steel coming through the back door? So I'm going to unpack this back at you in a couple of ways. One is to reinforce the point that when you have a producer, a major, major dominant producer like China producing at below market rates, um, it affects the entire supply chain starting upstream all the way downstream. The Mexico challenge is um, a piece of this. And again, the challenge is worldwide. So I think with respect to Mexico, there are a couple pieces. One is to the extent that uh, upstream um, uh, steel is coming into Mexico and being worked on and then coming into the United States, you've got to figure out how to level the playing field there. Secondly, there's a, a much more blunt challenge with respect to um, steel coming into Mexico and uh, improperly coming to the, into the United States as Mexican steel. So there is a challenge with respect to the evasion of uh, trade programs and trade frameworks where steel that's not properly Mexican is coming in uh, as Mexican steel and enjoying the preferences that we provide to the Mexican economy and Mexican producers. So again, with respect to uh, steel production, in order for the United States to continue to be able to produce, to continue to grow our steel industry, to continue to uh, grow cleaner steel industries. Uh, what you see is a number of programs that we are putting in place to ensure the integrity of trade systems. The challenge right now is, and steel is an excellent, excellent example, that um, there is no such thing as free trade in steel. The market in steel globally is significantly distorted by what we are calling the non-market policies and practices coming out of China. Supply that's being um, uh, created, production plans that are not linked to demand. And so what happens is you have a significant depression of prices and it requires economies like the United States to work with other economies that want to be open, that want to openly trade, to take more significant defensive measures against the unfair practices that have infected this sector. Ambassador Tai, do you see the similar dynamics and what you're describing in steel happening right now with the EV market? 100 percent. It's the same pattern that we see repeated over and over in different sectors. And the challenge for us is, is not, this has not been our practice. Largely, we have um, 
really adhered to this notion that if you just keep taking down barriers, if you just keep trying to trade more, if you just keep chasing efficiency, that everything will work out great. The challenge is that uh, in every one of these sectors, we see that uh, Chinese practices allow for Beijing to capture larger and larger shares of the global market so that you end up with a dominant producer in this entire economy. And what happens is the rest of us become extremely vulnerable and reliant on that supply. What we are trying to do is to um, uh, find opportunities for us to defend, to stand up, so that we can restore more freedom to trade, more freedom to economy, more freedom for other economies to stand up to the coercion that results when you have these types of vulnerabilities that can be used to create political pressures on economies. Well, the Biden administration made very clear that tariffs on Chinese EVs, bigger tariffs, are coming down the pipeline. But Secretary Yellen also said the U.S., quote, won't take anything off the table when it comes to this overcapacity coming out of China. We, though, have not seen one single WTO complaint from the United States. Is that potentially a tool that you can use? I wonder if you get your TP, so your talking points from my uh, Republican senator uh, counterparts from my hearing earlier this week. Look, uh, the World Trade Organization is incredibly is an incredibly important, valuable institution in the world uh, as part of the uh, post-World War II Bretton Woods framework. Um, the World Trade Organization is critical to the functioning of a modern world economy. That said, we also are very clear in our commitment to the WTO lies our commitment to reforming the WTO. Um, I know this conversation is actually not unique to the WTO. All of the Bretton Woods institutions, um, the, the IMF, the World Bank, this is their week. Um, in all of the conversations today, what you hear uh, in all of those conversations is the question of how do these institutions evolve to meet the challenges that we're facing today. With respect to the WTO, that is also true. And in terms of uh, WTO dispute settlement, we, as the United States, are very, very proud of our record with respect to challenging Chinese practices at the WTO. What we have found over time, however, is that each one of those cases that we bring, each victory that we score, ends up being a quite limited victory. It ends up in quite limited change. What we are dealing with in terms of the challenge of the Chinese economic system is structural. It's systemic. And so that's why we are uh, bringing more um, strategy. We are bringing more creativity to look for more effective ways to level the playing field, working with other like-minded economies and also working to raise these concerns inside of the WTO. Ambassador, it's funny you bring up Republicans and their talking points, because broad strokes wise, what we see is that whether or not we get another Biden administration or Trump back into the White House, trade policies look almost the same when it comes to China. Do you see a divergence in what we potentially could see from Trump or Biden, given the fact that we still have Trump era tariffs right now under this administration? So I think what I will say is this, that um, whether it's Republicans or Democrats, um, going back to the earlier comments around the China shock, we are uh, together, and I think that this also applies outside of the United States as well, we are uh, coming to a realization and raising in our consciousness um, a common assessment with respect to diagnosing what the problem is, what the source of today's world economic and trade challenges is. Then you have to move on to what are you going to do about it. And with respect to the Biden administration, we are very proud of our record. First of all, that tariffs are an important tool in the trade toolbox and that it is important to use them effectively and strategically and to know what the leverage is with respect to the tariffs. So yes, we continue to retain tariffs for strategic purposes. Second, the Biden administration hasn't rested on just trade or just tariffs to address the challenges that we face with respect to competing fairly with China. We have also, as you've seen, activated significant investments into the United States economy for the U.S. workers and for American infrastructure. It's the bipartisan infrastructure law, chips and science, the Inflation Reduction Act, the investments into the clean energy revolution. 
In addition to that, you also see that we have initiated an investigation into China's unfair non-market practices that have been alleged by five of our labor unions with respect to their maritime, uh, logistics, and shipbuilding sectors. When you take these three segments together, what you have is the articulation of the Biden administration's China trade response. Ambassador, I just want to ask you a question very quickly about Chinese EVs. Have you had a decision on that? Can we expect a conclusion anytime soon? So I'm not quite sure. There's not a specific question before us. I think um, with respect to um, uh, maritime logistics and shipbuilding, for instance, there is a petition that was presented to us. I think to your point, it's um, what are we going to do about um, uh, this trend that we see repeating itself in the EV sector? Again, we have an entire set of tools before us. Uh, many of them are uh, with the U.S. Trade Representative, whether it's uh, with respect to investigations that we can begin, uh, whether it's uh, looking at the set of tariffs that are enshrined in um, our tariff review, which has um, uh, been ongoing um, for uh, the last 18 months. Um, with respect to that uh, tariff review, um, I am confident that uh, as a whole of government uh, exercise that we have in an undertaking with uh, deliberation, seriousness, especially with respect to looking at more strategic, more effective deployment of the tariffs that we have to address the inequities in our trade relationship with China, I am confident that uh, that conclusion will be coming soon. Ambassador, can I just conclude with the following question, and it's probably difficult to answer directly, but the issues that you and I have discussed, that we've discussed over the last 10 minutes or so, as we started this conversation, they're not new. They've been at the forefront of many economists' minds for a long, long time. What strikes me as somewhat amusing is that it took someone like Donald Trump in 2016 to put them at the forefront of American politics, to shake the establishment, to almost make this consensus. And when I was listening to Secretary Yellen over the last few weeks, I just thought, this feels like a Secretary Yellen discovery tour, something personal to her, and nothing really new for policy. Ambassador, can I ask you, what took so long for the establishment in America to figure out this was the road they needed to go down? Well, it's an excellent question because, you know, um, what I would do is uh, I would actually have um, leaders in trade policy uh, take ownership of uh, the call, the earliest calls for the need for attention to the challenges that we are all focused on now. Um, these are issues that we have been raising at the WTO bilaterally with China very directly. For a very long time, we had direct uh, dialogues with China where we would raise these issues over and over. We would raise them with our partners. I think part of what you see is the increasing pressure that is being placed on uh, e economic dynamics. Uh, one last point I wanted to make with respect to inflation. The inflation conversation gets attached to tariffs a lot. The more we are talking about inflation and examining our worldwide experience with this, um, with this phenomenon over the last couple of years, the more we are realizing that inflationary pressures are linked to the supply challenges that we have. Those supply challenges go to our vulnerabilities, over-concentration, the domination that we see by certain producers in the world economy. I think that is, the, that is the next area where we need to drive coalescence around our analysis so that we can work together, whether it's Democrats and Republicans, whether it's the United States yep. and other countries on solutions. Ambassador, looking forward to having this conversation in person next time. Enjoy New York. Thank you so much for your time over the last 10 minutes or so. The U.S. Trade Representative, Ambassador Catherine Tsai there on a whole range of trade issues. If you are just joining us, welcome to the program. We should probably kick it off with what's happening in the equity market. Equity futures on the S&P 500 just about turning positive moments ago. In the equity market on the Nasdaq, we're still negative by only a tenth of 1%. The Russell just about unchanged on the small caps. If you switch up the board and turn to the bond market, we'll look at a two-year, a 10-year, and a 30-year. The two-year at the moment down two basis points, 496. 43 on a two-year maturity. On a 10-year, we're down five basis points to 457.96. Strikes overnight from Israel. 
and Iran, according to reports. In the commodity market, though, no big move higher. We're down by 0.7% on Brent crude at 86.49. On WTI, we're down six tenths of 1% at 82.21. Under surveillance this morning, our top story is Israel launching a retaliatory strike on Iran following this weekend's missile and drone attack. Explosions were heard in Iran's third largest city. UN watchdogs saying nuclear facilities didn't sustain any damage. Elsewhere, a Netflix reporting better than expected first quarter earnings. The streamer rebounding from a post-COVID slowdown. Netflix also saying it will stop reporting both paid quarterly membership and revenue per subscriber in the first quarter of 2025. That stock has been trading negative all morning and is down something like 5% at the moment. And finally, Apple bowing to Beijing's latest request, removing WhatsApp and threads from its Chinese app store. In the United States, lawmakers trying to force China's bite dance to sell TikTok. They're the latest protectionist measures by both countries. Unicredit's Eric Nielsen joined us now at the IMF World Bank spring meetings, where trade is very much at the top of the agenda. Eric, good morning to you. Good morning. It's good to see you. Let's talk about what's happening. And can you give us the impression, your impression of the tone of cooperation in Washington, D.C., with all of these protectionist spats ongoing? It's terrible, right? I, uh, I came to Washington thinking this is, you know, we are on a slippery slope. It's getting worse. Maybe I was naive. But I've been stunned by, by how fast this thing is moving. And, and suddenly you hear senior people not longer talk about terrorists next year, but banning stuff, right? Uh, EVs, for example. It's a, um, so I'm starting to think, we are thinking as a Western analyst about where does the U.S. go, how does Ch- uh, Europe follow, and these sort of things. I think we have to start to think about how will China react to what we do because we will do things now. It's a, and, and um, pretty dramatic things, I fear. And this used to be an economics forum, and you said yeah. recently it's sounding more and more like a national security forum. Yeah. How big a change is that over the last few years? It's big, right? It's a, I mean, let, let's remember, national security has always sort of been the big thing, right? I mean, ultimately, a country, this is the, the number one, right? But for 30, 40 years, we had a, a, an understanding and belief that globalization, economic openness, all these sort of things took care of it. Remember, Larry Summers once said, there's never been war between two countries with McDonald's, right? So the whole idea that if we sort of expand, we invest, it doesn't happen. That has changed now. So, Russia happened. Yeah. Well, Russia happened, right? So, it's, so certainly within the last two years, the game has completely changed, right? Do you think now we've moved on from a world where we're past peak global, free global trade? Yeah, yeah, for sure, for sure. This is a, and, and, and the, yes, this I am, a, I'm sure about, and, and what worries me more, if we always go in ways, what worries me more right now is we are in sort of in a vacuum, but we don't know what regime we have, right? We had, we've had all these years, the IMF sort of set the tone of macro thinking, we have WTO, I think you're, with all respect, the ambassador, saying you, they always work through the WTO, where America was not, you know, always cooperative in the WTO, let me put it this way. So it's, I, I don't think it's fair to put blame just on one here, sure. but, it, but, but we can certainly observe that things are... So where does this leave institutions like the IMF? Where is it in the where debate? Does, where does this fragmentation leave them? Because it almost feels like they're steps behind what the countries are coming here disgusting and concerned about. Yeah, I mean, so exactly. So this is uh, economics and economic policy making has become secondary to national security. So, so the way I would put it, in, and a senior official said to me a few years ago, when you met with the president in the sort of big strategy meetings, the first one who spoke was economic policy, and then sort of things for now it's national security. So my impression is that in the U.S., Jake Solomon stopped by saying so and so, and then we, everyone we, follows. And then everyone follows. And, and when the economy says, well, this industrial policy and, uh, and, and, and protectionism is not good, he said, oh, we will do very little, very little, but very high walls. But into connectivity. Why is it that Tesla cars in China, which are made in China, are not allowed into any parking lot near a government building? Because EVs have become data collection centers, right? Yep. And we haven't, I don't think we have fully got our head around this. And as it happens now... It's, 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 for us economists, it's, it's problematic. Let me You've put got that to way. think about the economic outcomes. So let's try and do that. This is clearly the direction of travel. Governments are known for their efficient allocation of resources. And I just wonder, what are the consequences of this massive industrial policy effort that's taking hold right now? What are they going to be? What does this look like five years down the road? So, as you said, I mean, certainly less trade. 
um, home sourcing, French sourcing. Higher and, inflation, lower growth. Yeah, so, so certainly lower growth and, and higher inflation. This is almost for sure. So less, less global growth. I mean, so it's not a, a surprise that the IMF has sort of, they have this sort of three and a half percent global growth, which is a lot less than it used to be, right? So, it's a, so I think we are, for the next sort of say five years, you're going to have lower growth. But it really, really depends on how the West reacts to this. And then, of course, how China and other countries react to us. Uh, so if, if we had an intelligent and coordinated for the Western world industrial policy idea, I think it's, it's not all is lost, right? But the, the, the risk is that it sort of falls off and, and the institutions are no longer playing a role in sort of getting people together. Yeah. Right? Eric, I was going to say, enjoy the last day in Washington, D.C., but it doesn't sound like you've enjoyed it at all. <laughs> no, Maybe it's, just uh, the weather. It's warm. It is. It, it, I, I, have, I have been disappointed, right? I mean, it, yeah. it is a, it is, it, it's problematic. Um, in, um, it, it, it dominates the debate, and it, and it should. But actually, I think, it, as you sort of hinted at, it doesn't dominate the official debate, as far as I know. I mean, so the it's seminars we talk about now, and, and we talk about environmental things. It's all important stuff. But it's sort of, we kind of have to anchor it together and, and, and see what, if this is the first thing that we have to understand, that, that globalization and free trade has, is gone, then we have to rethink as economists where do we then take it and, and um, how do we sort of, and we're not very good as a, as a, as a professor, we're not very good at, at reprogramming ourselves, right? In that I sense, have a I feeling think. we'll be talking about exactly the same thing next spring I when we so. see, meet each other again yeah. here in Washington. Eric, this was great. Thanks, Thanks, for, for, having, Thanks for having me. Eric Nielsen there of Uni Credit. Up next on the programme, we'll catch up with the Santander share, Anna Butin, and the IMF First Managing Director, First Deputy Managing Director, Gita Gopanaf. That's all coming up, up next on the programme. Live from the nation's capital, good morning to you and welcome to the program. Let's start with the price action in the equity market on the S&P 500 going into the opening bell. We've recovered. We were deeply negative. We were down more than 1%. We're now just about unchanged on the S&P. The rally in the bond market continues. We're down three or four basis points on a 10-year, 459.60. Under surveillance this morning, the Fed and ECB divided. Growth in Europe um, has been mediocre and has been um, much slower than growth in the United States. But on both sides, you have an employment and a job market which is uh, phenomenal. We are clearly seeing signs of recovery now, beginning timid and picking up in the course of 24. It's the latest this morning. The ECB and Federal Reserve on diverging paths. The ECB looking to cut rates as soon as this summer. In the United States, Fed officials are warning cuts may not come at all this year. Anna Botin is looking to navigate these challenges and more as chair of Banco Santander and the IIF. Anna joins us in Washington this morning. Anna, good morning to you. Good morning. Thank you so much for being with us today. We had a guest with us about five minutes ago. It was pretty depressing. Very downbeat on cooperation in Washington, the future for growth outside of the United States. How downbeat are you and your team about the same things? Well, you know, first of all, we are at war. We have two wars, which is a human tragedy, and our thoughts are with all the people that are suffering. But aside from those very important issues, which obviously we must deal with first, the economy does not look bad. So, you know, we have managed to bring down inflation. Remember, we were around 9%, 10%. We were around 3 4 in most countries. Really important. That's the one thing we cannot allow to get out of control. We have growth. Yes, lower growth, but growth overall. And third, we have very high employment levels. If I think about Santander's Europe and America's footprint, every single one of our countries is at historically high levels of employment. So, you know, this is... This is not bad. If a year ago, you had asked many people, where are we going to be? Anybody that said soft landing, you would say, oh, you're being too optimistic. We have a super soft landing so far. So, so far, so good. The growth profile is certainly much better than we thought it would be, not just 12 months ago, but maybe even three months ago. Hmm. Though we still have two wars, we also have increased protectionism. It's been a key feature of the meetings this week, as you well know. A backslide towards industrial policy in places like the United States. Can I ask you, as someone who leads a bank, does that make it more difficult to be an international bank 
against that backdrop? The key thing we're all looking to, and this is not different from what everybody is saying, is that the, the most difficult and the, you know, the key risks now are geopolitical. As I said, the macro looks much better, at least for now. So as we think about what is happening and what these geopolitics mean for supply chains, uh, for our business, understanding that this is going to mean more structural inflation because, you know, you're going to have higher cost. Understanding that you need to prioritize the, uh, defense or national security or in the case of companies, you know, diversification, which again is a key asset at least for us, and this is really very valuable. So these, these are the things you need to think about. How do I protect my business at a time when the world is increasingly volatile, where you're having a, a big shift in terms of we want secure supply chain? Yes, we want it to be affordable, good prices, but security is paramount. And of course, we also want to ensure that we can manage the green and the climate transition. If geopolitical risks are your number one concern and that could potentially mean a spike in inflation, do you expect the ECB to then, what's been pretty much forecasted by everyone, go ahead of the Fed and have this rate cut in June? So, you know, what we're all thinking about is what is the terminal rate? Where does this end up? That is the key question. And our view and as an institution is that that terminal rate is not going to be the same in Europe as in the U.S., it's probably be around, if you talk to most economists, 4% in the U.S., around 3% in Europe. What it means is that, let's say, rates will end up around those levels, around 3%, 4%. And that is really what we, that is what allows us to plan. Again, that is not a bad thing for commercial banks, for the sector. Negative rates were unsustainable, risky for the system, very high rates kill the economy, you know, low rates, maybe we are going to have too low growth. And that is the one thing we need to focus on. How do we manage an economy where terminal rates are a bit higher because all the structural factors, not just defense, demographics, decarbonization. True. So you have structural trends that are more inflationary than before. Slow growth. What do we do about it? So I know that you're in a quiet period, so you can't talk directly about the financials. But can you help me understand how do you plan for things like net interest income when you're across so many different regions with so many different policies and so many different so-called terminal rates? How do you plan for that kind of thing? What does that look like? Look, sometimes that is a global bank, but basically it's Europe and the Americas. And we have 166 million customers. First thing is diversification is key, not just for us, for anybody. And we have diversification by businesses, five global businesses, and by regions and countries. So that means that if something doesn't go well in one country, usually it gets compensated by another. And so what you try is to really have a context for risk appetite. Do we take more risk, less risk? Uh, we don't manage interest rates, right? Yep. As I said, the context is really good for financial institutions, especially commercial banks like ours. Why? Because negative rates meant that with a big retail base, you're not charged, but you were being charged by the central banks for 20% of our deposits, and we couldn't charge. So positive rates, low growth, high unemployment is a, not a bad scenario for, for commercial banks. Some other banks have pulled back from the United States, international banks. I'm thinking specifically of HSBC, BNP Paribas are still there. They still have a presence. You've been leaning in a little bit more. Could you develop that for us this morning? What are you planning in the United States? How big is your presence going to be going forward from here? We're very excited about the opportunities in the United States. We're very confident we'll reach the 15% return on tangible equity. And we're, we're keeping it simple. Play to our strengths. Where do we have global scale that helps us in this market? Make sure that we are leveraging our network. And so in the biggest business, which is the consumer, we have something none of the other foreign banks have or had, which is at scale auto business. We're number five in the US. We're number one in Europe. We bring our OEMs here. And second, we have scale to invest in our own technology. So we're going to deploy our own technology to launch a digital bank to make sure we can fund the auto business competitively. Simple. Anna, this was brilliant. I know you've got a super busy morning, so we appreciate you carving out some time for us here at Bloomberg. Thank you so much. Great to be here. Anna got in there, the Banco Santander chairman. Let's go over to the IMF headquarters where Lisa's standing by with a special guest. Lisa, we're going to throw it over to you. Thank you so much, John. I am here at the IMF headquarters with Gita Gopinath, the first deputy managing director for the IMF at a time of highly fraught geopolitical tensions. All this discussion about fragmentation. 
You wrote a paper that was fascinating about fragmentation, just how much of it is actually happening, the onshoring, nearshoring, reshoring, uh, et cetera. Yes. So Lisa, if you look at the data and if you look at just a superficial number, which is the ratio of global trade to GDP, now that number is holding up really well and you think everything looks fine. But if you look under the surface, you're absolutely seeing signs of fragmentation. And if you look at trade between a US-centric bloc versus a China-centric bloc, that trade has gone down by much more than trade within geopolitically aligned firms. That's also true for foreign direct investment. So we are seeing these shifts, but at the same time, we're also seeing the role of connector countries like Vietnam and Mexico that are coming in and re channeling supply chains around the world. And all of this can raise the cost, ultimately, of goods for countries. Which is really the key question here, which is how much structurally higher is inflation in this new era of fragmentation? This is a main concern, and these are numbers that we have to uh, determine. And now, we're still at an early stage, so we, ha we aren't looking at very dramatic movements over here. But if this process continues, it could lead to much more inflationary pressures. Do you have a rate in mind about, is it 3% or 4%? Is that the kind of rate we can imagine in this world? Right now, based on the scale at which it's happening, I wouldn't say it will be that large. But again, the risk is if it heads in a much more worse direction. It seems like this is the path of travel. Everyone's talking about fragmentation. Everyone's talking about protectionist policies. In an era where so many countries seem to be rejecting free trade, what's the IMF's role? We have a really important role to play as a multilateral institution. You know, the world is moving away from a rules-based trading system. So what needs to happen is diplomacy and pragmatic approaches. And that's what we're trying to push for in, through this meeting, getting countries together to work at least on areas where they can agree on. Like on services trade, there's much more progress that's happening on services trade. We need to work together on debt issues, on climate issues. That will hopefully rebuild trust and slow the process of fragmentation. We also see an increase in geopolitical tensions, and we saw this overnight uh, with the attacks in Iran. There were some real questions around what the price of oil would do. It did nothing, but that's as people were talking about de-escalation. Edgar Denny yesterday was talking about the possibility of an oil shock akin to the 1970s, with oil prices going to $100 a barrel, should this escalate. Do you foresee a similar type of thing happening? This is a risk we worry about. If there is a serious escalation, which means a much more wider regional escalation than what we've seen so far, then yes, we could have a severe oil shock. But we're not there yet, and as you can see in terms of oil prices, you know, it went up some, but it's come back down. We have supply excess capacity in Saudi Arabia. We have non-OPEC countries putting a lot more oil out on the market. So there are other sources of supply that can you know, buffer these, these shocks. But if there's a large-scale escalation in the Middle East, that is a problem. Is that the line in the sand, $100 a barrel, and that would consist of the shock? I think if going up $100 a barrel would be problematic, but even going from here to $100 a barrel would be, would be difficult for countries to deal with who are still fighting the last inflation fight, which is to bring inflation back down to target. One thing that the IMF has talked extensively about is concern about sovereign debt, in particular in the United States and the overhang there. What's the outcome of that? Is the fear of some sort of sort of slugflation or just sort of a sluggish growth kind of picture because of the overhang? Is it higher rates and potentially a Liz Trust moment, which I've been talking about and get shot down all the time in the U.S., but is there something like that that could potentially happen? You know, the U.S. is running very large deficits for a country where demand is very strong and there is still the last mile in terms of bringing inflation down. So for all those reasons, the deficit, I mean, you can't have a deficit with 7% of GDP. It needs to be lower. And if you project out, it's going to stay at those high levels for a while. That has consequences, of course, for debt servicing in the U.S. But in a sense, the bigger problem is in terms of spillovers to the rest of the world. Because for the rest of the world, when you have so much of debt being issued by the U.S., that can crowd out the, lend, the borrowing from other countries. Their cost of borrowing goes up and their debt servicing costs go up by much more. So, you know, I wouldn't say the U.S. has a debt sustainability problem now, but at the same time, when the U.S. is borrowing that heavily, 
that causes rates to be that much higher. It has implications for the rest of the world and for you know corporations and households in the U.S. How much higher? I mean, could you see rates staying here between 525 and 550 for the rest of this year, for even into next year? That would not be our baseline. We would expect to see uh, rates coming down. So you know, right now there is a it's for getting inflation back to target. So we expect that to con- will come down. You know, it's going to take a little longer, uh, but we expect that to come down. The question is whether it comes back down to what we saw in the decade after the GFC. And there, you know, at right now, that doesn't seem to be the case. One thing that you talk about is this era of fragmentation is going to lead to a higher inflationary regime. Do you think it's appropriate for central banks to have a higher inflation target long term as sort of their goal, say not 2 percent, but 2.5 percent or somewhere between 2 and 3 percent, just because it is a different reality now? Yep. So firstly, that is a conversation we should not be having now. We need to ensure that inflation the comes back is. down to 2 percent. Uh, you know, monetary policy can pin down a level of inflation. Yes, if you're going to have a lot of volatility in that inflation statistic, that could create problems because we are in a much more shock prone world. But again, uh, you know, that is a conversation for later. For later. But it might be. Yes. Okay. Gita Gopinath, I know, has to run. Otherwise, she will walk off the set because you have to get to a panel that you guys are hosting. That was wonderful to speak with you. Thank you so much, Gita. Thank you so much. John, back to you. Lisa, great work. Thank you so much. Lisa Bravitz there with the IMF First Deputy Managing Director, Gita Gopinath. Part of that conversation about fiscal sustainability, just to recap some of those headlines for you. The United States doesn't have a debt sustainability problem as of now. As of now is probably where the emphasis is right there and where it should be. The U.S. cannot have a 7 percent of GDP deficit. It must come down. It's part of the problem here in Washington, D.C., and we've been having this conversation for the last couple of days. America is running a very large deficit, and that's part part of the reason why we're seeing this so-called U.S. exceptionalism. And that U.S. exceptionalism is coming with problems for the rest of the world. You don't just get the positive spillover from economic growth. You also get much higher interest rates, and with that, a much stronger dollar. And what you've heard over the last few days is complaint after complaint about what's developing in foreign exchange. And those complaints are coming from all over the place, including Malaysia, who have had to intervene, South Korea and Japan, who are stressing that they might do the very same. And South Korea and Japan, officials from both those countries, had a meeting earlier this week with the Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen, and no doubt they were airing some of those concerns. Now, the big question for the IMF and the World Bank this week is whether that continues. How much longer will this go on for? The duration question is the one that's being asked in Washington, D.C., and none of us can give you an answer to it, because, AMH, the longer this goes on, the more problems that accumulate, the more stress that will build, and ultimately, words won't be enough from Japan and South Korea. Absolutely. And Jonathan, you didn't just hear that from Gita. This was in their report. What I found interesting is they said, and don't expect this to be a quick remedy to what's going on in the fiscal policy in the United States, because also on the sidelines of the IMF, what everyone is talking about is the U.S. election. And the fact of the matter is the United States is not going to spend less. and There's not going to be tax hikes in an election year. So getting their fiscal policy under wraps to be a more healthy outlook, that's not going to happen this year, and it's definitely not going to happen in 2025, what Adam Posen said. The conversations will continue on Monday when we're back in New York City. Just to give you a feel for the lineup on Monday morning, Dean Kernan of Macro Risk Advisors will join us. Al Salinos of RBC, JP Morgan's Bob Michael, and European Investment Bank President Nadia Calvino joining us around the table in New York. From Washington, D.C., thank you very much for being with us here at the IMF World Bank Spring Meetings. This was Bloomberg Surveillance.